Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Can we well back there? Excellent. Excellent.
But the commercial, the commercial I just thought it was a
the mic slot.
tap into the ghost range. It's live. Oh, it's cool. Cool. As long as you speak to the room, it'll pick you up pretty well for the folks on the Okay. Um, Testing one, two, three. When you're ready, you just click that on right there. I think she's going to use a cordless mic, but stand over on the side. But this will all be on if you want to use this one or cordless. It's whatever you prefer. And then, in you saw when we do the panels, you just, we just need to turn those red buttons to green. You're good. You could, I can, I can put a reserve sign down if you want a chair. Okay, I think we have. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started in a minute. And before we do, just a very quick announcement as you all get seated, that we're going to pass through a photo release form just to make sure we can take amazing photos and memorialize our discussions today. So let's get started. Yeah, Taryn, good. All right, so I um, would love to extend a warm welcome to all of you here today, uh, joining us in beautiful Washington, DC. We're here at ASU's uh, Connor uh, and Barrett's uh, Washington Center. And also I'd like to welcome folks that are tuning in via our YouTube live stream today. So my name is Jessica Rousset. I'm the deputy director at Arizona State University's Interplanetary Initiative. And we're very pleased to be the host and the sponsor for today's forum, uh, where we'll be discussing uh, the deterrence of conflict in space. So before we get into the program today, um, I'd like just to take a few minutes to share with you how Arizona State University, uh, a new American university, is transforming higher education to better society, both on Earth and off planet. 
So ASU has taken a comprehensive, inclusive, and truly transdisciplinary approach to space. We have over, over 300 investigators that are focused on this topic across dozens of centers, schools, and institutes. And so I thought I'd just highlight a few of those programs to give you a flavor for how sort of broad ranging our efforts are. I wanna start with um, uh, highlighting the scientists and engineers that are at our School of Earth and Space Exploration and our Fulton Schools for, of Engineering, who over several decades now have been involved in over 25 NASA missions in uh, a variety of, of capacities. So uh, building uh, critical instrumentation for these missions, being on science teams, or leading those missions uh, all the way from the top. And in fact, we have four such missions that our faculty are principal investigators uh, on. Sort of shifting gears towards more of the business side of things. So for those of us that are working professionals uh, that might uh, be interested in entering a career in the space sector or um, uh, advancing our careers in the space sector, we now uh, offer an executive master's in global management uh, through which students, and we have several actually here, uh, really gain a profound understanding of the entire space ecosystem from a, a policy and governance and business perspective. And that's offered through ASU's Thunderbird School of Global Management. Sort of on a, another uh, facet of what we do in sort of terms of design, those of our students that are enrolled to become future architects can now specialize in space architecture and extreme environments with a master's uh, degree offered through ASU's uh, Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. And then we have programs that are solely focused on uh, capacity building and creating new pathways to space for emerging space faring nations with uh, the Milo Institute, which is a collaboration between ASU and Lockheed Martin. Uh, and we have David Thomas here, the executive director for the Milo Institute, um, if you'd like to talk to him and learn more about those programs. And so um, this just highlights, I think, uh, hopefully for you a little bit, the breadth of the space ecosystem and uh, enterprise that we have at ASU. And of course, throughout all of this ecosystem, we engage with lots of external partners. We have over 120 such partnerships. So ASU's interplanetary initiative uh, is an effort that branches out uh, across this entire um, ecosystem that I just described for you. Uh, an interplanetary institute started, an initiative started about six years ago. It's the brainchild of the uh, president of ASU, Dr. Michael Crow, um, and partnered up with Dr. Lindy elkins Tanton. She's a planetary scientist who's now the vice president for interplanetary. She's also the principal investigator for the NASA Psyche mission that is set to launch uh, in the fall, in October. Um, and so the interplanetary initiative, um, our goal is to drive sort of societal and systems level solution for solutions for a positive human space future. And we do that by convening thought leaders to work together to answer the biggest questions that we face as we become an interplanetary species. There are a lot of different ways in which we um, effectuate and activate our mission. One of the ways in which we do this is by seed funding projects that are conceived in a very, using a very intentional methodology that was developed in fact by Lindy elkins Stanton. Um, and um, that um, aims at the biggest questions um, and um, uh, engages the broadest sets of collaborators across disciplines, um, cultures, and sectors. So we funded over 30 projects using the specific uh, methodology, and I'll share with you just a few examples. They're very diverse uh, because of the broad set of collaborators that we bring to think about these big questions that really will take sort of lifetimes and many experts to, to answer. So one new project that we're gonna be funding is gonna be looking at new economic models uh, for, it, for, for space. Uh, one that we've been funding for the past year has been examining how spirituality and religion drive why we go to space and the narratives that we use. And then there's sort of a more uh, longer uh, term uh, project that we've been supporting um, that's called the Earth Operations Center. And this is a virtual reality-based collaborative decision support tool that combines uh, Earth systems data and economic models to assess um, the health of the planet. So, and there are many more, so I'm happy to tell you about um, the entire portfolio, but today is the product of one of those seed funded projects that, that uh, was 
sort of conceived a little over a year ago. And the animating big question that drove this project was how might we reduce the uh, probability of a cataclysmic space war? So we, of course, refined that big question leading to the three topics that um, are gonna be uh, guiding the three panels um, today. Um, but I'd like to say that you know the, the the way we've designed this forum is very much in keeping with the mission of interplanetary, meaning that we've uh, invited speakers from uh, many different perspectives. So you'll see folks from you know government and industry and academia and nonprofits in a very open type forum to really drive a well-rounded discussion today. We also think it's really critical um, to uh, bring sort of a, a common understanding to complex topics like the ones we'll be discussing today and, 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 and giving, making that accessible to a very broad audience. We think that's important to drive better strategies and solutions for a more peaceful and sustainable future in space for all of us. So we hope today that we'll all, I know I will, learn a lot, um, but also we'll make some new connections and ultimately drive some new collaborations because it is, ultimately about taking action and, uh, and progressing society. So I do wanna give a quick shout out. We have a number of ASU students here that are gonna take some notes throughout the day because we do intend to produce a conference report that we'll be, we'll be sharing. Let's see, um, I think um, with that, um, I just wanna sort of close my remarks by uh, saying that I am personally very excited to learn about the ways in which, which conflict uh, is currently manifesting in space, uh, how our actions today and in the future might you know, be geopolitically destabilizing, whether they're intended or not, and then really learning um, ways in which we might mitigate risk and deter conflict as we have an increasing number of actors and players operating in the space domain. So again, I'd like to uh, welcome you all today uh, to join us in these conversations. Look forward to your questions and your engagement with the panelists. And um, I'd like to now formally introduce uh, and sort of pass hosting duties to <laughs> General Bob Schmidl. Thank you so much, Bob, for uh, leading the charge and helping us bring this forum to fruition. It's, it's been really great working with you. And I'll just say a few words about Bob before handing over the mic. So. Um, General Schmidl is uh, the University Advisor on Cyber Capabilities and Conflict Studies at ASU, where he's also Professor of Practice at our School of Politics and Global Studies and a Senior Fellow in the Center on the Future of War. A little bit about his background, while on active duty, he served as the first Deputy Commander of the US Cyber Command, where he was responsible for standing up the command while also executing full uh, spectrum cyber operations. He subsequently uh, head, was the head of Marine Aviation. And at his final assignment on active duty, he served as the Principal Deputy Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. I am going to read your full bio, Bob. So um, this is fine. So he has extensive operation flying, <laughs> flying experience. He's amassed uh, nearly 4,700 hours in tactical fighters participating in combat operations, both in Iraq and Bosnia. General Schmidl has a bachelor's degree from Drew University, a master's degree from American University, and earned his doctorate from Georgetown University. Um, his thesis, which now I'm, I'm quite inclined to read, recognized, recognized with distinction, was titled, The Power of Context in Shaping Moral Choices. Um, he has numerous uh, publications in the fields of moral philosophy, social psychology, and military history. So I think we're in uh, wonderful hands. Thank you, Bob, for guiding us through uh, the discussions today. Uh, we're very much looking forward to it, including, of course, our, our keynote. Uh, very much looking forward to that as well. So thank you, Bob, and welcome, everyone. That one on? Okay, I'll just use this one. Can, is it on? Can we hear? Is it working? Okay. Um, so, thank thank you for the introduction. You know, the, the the common expression in Washington is, "I wish my mother was here to to, to listen to that." So, General Burt. So, let me tell you how we got here. Um, there's a retired uh, Air Force general named Mike Holmes, who's a friend of mine, and Mobile and I have been flying together, and I've been getting him checked out in tailwheel aircraft, teaching aerobatics. And a number of months back, every time we get together, we talk about flying for 10 minutes and then we spend the rest of the time kind of catching up on what we're doing. And, I'm and I was telling him about this, this program that we were trying to put together. And he said, I know the, exactly the right person to talk to that audience. And it was General Burt. 
And so without any further introduction, he connected, uh, gave me the phone number. I connected and called into the office. And lo and behold, one of the folks that works in the office for her had been my aide when I was at Cyber Command and uh, an Air Force officer, just a tremendous, tremendous officer. So that's kind of how this all came together. I think most of you in this room uh, know this if you've been around Washington, but we really appreciate this. She has no life. And when you are in these, when you are in these kind of positions, you, you do, you have no life. Somebody schedules every minute of every day, 365 days a year, and you're never far away from the next phone call. And you just pick up the phone sometimes and you're just kind of wondering whether this is going to be a good call or not. And it's just the way life is. There's another standing joke here in Washington that an hour out of the Pentagon is like a day's worth of leave. So we're actually doing her a favor this morning by giving her an opportunity to get out of the Pentagon. Um, I, I'm not going to go through her entire bio, but a couple of things for those of you, especially for the students in here. What uh, General Burt does is she is the her title. She's the Deputy Chief of Space Operations for Operations cyber and nuclear for the United States Space Force. And what that means is that she is responsible for the operations, the sustainment of cyber operations, of nuclear operations for the Space Force. Right? It's a, just an awesome portfolio of things that she does uh, that, and that she is responsible for on a day-to-day -day basis. Interestingly, in her background, she is one of those unique people in, in the Department of Defense and in any of the uniformed services that has credibility both as a thinker and a tactician. So she was a graduate of the U.S. Navy, or the U.S. Navy, we only wish it was the U.S. Navy Fighter Weapons School, it was the U.S. Air Force Fighter Weapons School, and the, uh, which is a tactical level how to employ to do things, how to actually get things done. And then she has a, uh, is a graduate of the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. So that school, and each of the services have one, is sort of takes you to the operational level and slash strategic level. So she has a unique ability. She's been a tactician at the execution level and also has undergone a, a rigorous academic um, uh, investigation, if you will, an analysis of what happens at the operational and the strategic level. And, and I just can't emphasize enough how unique that those qualities are and how well that serves the country that she is in the position that she's in now. The, uh, the last thing that I, I wanted to mention about her, so uh, back to my aide, Brian Bell, when I contacted him and we got to talking about, you know, so tell me about General Byrd. Is there something that's not in her bio, something that would be interesting to note? And, and he mentioned a couple of things. I won't mention all of them, but one of them I will. And he said she, she cares so genuinely and so deeply about the, <clears throat> about the people on the staff that it is evident in everything that she does. We, we refer to that, <clears throat> excuse me, we refer to that as servant leadership. The fact that you know you are a leader, but you're not just leading an organization, you're actually serving the people in the organization. And in the world that I come from, in the world that General Burke comes from, quite frankly, you cannot pay a higher compliment to a senior officer than that. That they not only care about the mission of the organization, but that they care deeply about the people in it, and they mentor them, and they grow them, and they bring them up so that the next generation and in this case, it'll be literally the next generation, the first generation of space leaders will be able to and uh, take the helm of this organization and take it to the next level. So it's just extraordinary. We are extremely lucky to have her here this morning. And, and I am quite frankly, I'm really honored to be able to introduce her. So, yeah. Thank Well, good morning. It's hard to follow that, that lead in. So uh, it's an honor to be here this morning. Thank you, General Schmidl. Uh, Jessica, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's great to be here with Arizona State uh, in the Preventing Space War Forum. I have a few comments here that I have prepared. I'm really looking forward to getting through these and getting to your comments, but this will at least lay the groundwork uh, for how we are looking at this uh, as a service and working uh, in the space enterprise. 
Uh, it's also good to be here with Arizona State because uh, last June, Arizona State signed an agreement with the Space Force to become a member of the Services University Partnership Program. So Jessica gave you a lot of great information. I don't think it's any surprise the Space Force wants to leverage all that great experience uh, at Arizona State, which is why uh, we were glad to finally get them signed up uh, in the University Partnership Program and have been engaging uh, very aggressively with them to be engaged. It's okay. Uh, as many of you know, uh, space has become essential to our security and prosperity. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone here. Space systems are woven to our American way of life, affecting much of our daily lives and our economic system. From the use of satellites to surf the internet and call our friends, to enabling first responders to communicate and respond uh, to times of crisis, to time stamping financial transactions, and allowing the use of credit cards at gas stations. We harness the benefits of space every day. But space is not only integral to a part of our daily lives, it also underpins our national security. Space enables our military forces to anticipate threats, rapidly respond to crisis, and project power globally. The Joint Force depends on the availability of space-provided capabilities to execute its mission in competition, crisis, and conflict. To maintain the benefits all nations derive from space, U.S. policy aims to preserve stability and freedom of operations in, from, and to the domain. This hinges on our understanding of the activities occurring in orbit. As many of this room know, the space domain has become increasingly congested. So in 2008, just 15 years ago, we were tracking approximately 13,000 objects, of which about 3,000 were the result of China's irresponsible ASAT test one year prior. And of that 13,000, only about 1,500 of those were active satellites. Additionally, the ISS had around 130 reportable close approaches. So what a close approach means is that there is some object, a piece of debris that will come close to the souls that are on the ISS uh, and NASA works to do those debris avoidance maneuvers uh, in order to save or can ensure that something doesn't hit the ISS. Uh, and in that year, they executed one debris avoidance maneuver, which means they moved the entire ISS uh, to make sure that something did not hit it. Since that time, so 15 years now to today, 53 additional nations have become spacefaring. The number of on-orbit satellites has grown nearly 500%. And we now are tracking more than 45,000 total objects, including more than 2,700 pieces of trackable debris that are still on orbit from that same 2007 Chinese ASAP. From 2021 to 2022, we saw a 16% increase in tracked objects, a 31% increase in launches, and a 29% increase in payloads on orbit. In just the first half of this year, the ISS has already received 478 conjunction notifications and has conducted three avoidance maneuvers, many of which were the result of yet another irresponsible ASAT test, this time by the Russians in 2021, which generated 1,500 pieces of trackable debris and tens of thousands of lethal but non-trackable debris, all still in orbit. So I wish the story got better, but not only has space become more congested, but is also nearly now clearly a contested domain. China and Russia both view space as a warfighting domain and are developing, testing, and fielding sophisticated counter space capabilities intended to deny the US and our allies a space enabled advantage. As our pacing challenge, China has a range of counter space capabilities from terrestrial lasers that can disrupt, degrade, or destroy satellite sensors to direct anti-satellite munitions and electronic warfare jammers. And they are building a wartime space architecture to track and target US forces across all domains in order to fight and win a modern military conflict. Likewise, Russia remains an acute threat and continues to research, develop, and deploy a similar arsenal of counter space systems to neutralize US satellites, as evident by their cyber attack against a commercial satellite network and attempts to counter Ukraine's use of GPS, communications, and radar, Russia has demonstrated their belief that supremacy in space will be a decisive factor in winning future conflicts. It is clear our competitors understand the advantage that space provides. As the Chief of Space Operations, General Saltzman, pointed out during a recent space symposium address, we are in a new, spare, a new era in space, an era in which space is more congested, more contested, and includes increased competition from adversaries able to execute space-enabled attacks on our forces across air, land, and sea. 
protecting U.S. interests in space by contesting and controlling the domain and defending the joint force from space-enabled attacks is exactly why a space, force was, space Force was created. The ability to do both of those at the time and place of our choosing is what we refer to as space superiority. In the previous era, in which space was far less congested and contested, the U.S. had the freedom to fully exploit the space domain using asymmetric capabilities like global positioning system, satellite communications, and missile warning. Space, support, space superiority was a given. Today, we can no longer assume freedom of operations in orbit. A military service dedicated to maintaining space superiority is required. The other military services control and contest their associated domains according to their established doctrine. However, doctrine is based on operationally proven best practices and somewhat thankfully in space, we lack the historical insight that combat provides. Instead, we are beginning with a working theory of success to have a shared purpose and common understanding of our overall strategy in the domain to maintain space superiority. We call this theory of success competitive endurance. The goal of competitive endurance is to maintain a state of perpetual competition that our adversaries are never desperate nor emboldened enough to pursue destructive combat operations in space. To be locked in a struggle of stability in space below the threshold of crisis or conflict. That is the essence of competition. This also means there is no end, end to this competition. There is no victory in space. If we get this right, we will deter a crisis or conflict from extending into space. But if needed, we will ensure space superiority for the joint force in a manner that maintains safety, security, stability, and long-term sustainability of the space domain for all responsible actors. This theory of competitive endurance consists of three tenets, avoiding operational surprise, denying first mover advantage, and conducting responsible counter space campaigning. Let me explain how each of these three tenets work together to create the conditions that we desire. The first tenet, avoiding operational surprise, requires a timely, relevant, and actionable understanding of the space operational environment that allows military forces to plan, integrate, execute, and assess space operations, an activity we call space domain awareness. Through space domain awareness, we can detect, identify, attribute, and preempt irresponsible and hostile behaviors that undermine stability and security in the domain. The second tenet of competitive endurance is to deny first mover advantage in space. The historical pattern of using small numbers of complex satellites that are mission critical and take years to develop and launch means that during a conflict, the actor who goes on the offensive first will likely gain an upper hand. This is not a condition that supports stability nor an enduring state of competition. Instead, to change and pivot from that, the Space Force is working on a resilient space order of battle where preemptive attacks against US interests in space will not significantly impact our ability to exploit the domain. Should an adversary desire to disrupt, degrade, or destroy our capabilities, it would require such a massive and overt effort that it will become impractical and self-defeating, thus deterring such actions in the first place. Finally, the third tenet of competitive endurance is that the Space Force must prepare to maintain space superiority via responsible counterspace campaigning. This means continuing to lead in setting norms of responsible behavior such as those outlined in the Secretary of Defense's 2021 memo. Should counter space activities be necessary to protect the joint force from space enabled attack, principles such as operating professionally and with due regard, limiting the generation of long lived debris and sharing safety notifications to name a few, balance our counter space operations with the need to maintain the stability and sustainability of the orbit. These tenants avoiding operational surprise, denying first mover advantage and responsible counter space campaigning form the basis of our theory of success. And as a service, we are organizing and focusing our activities investments in three lines of effort towards that end. So our first line of effort is to field a combat ready force. This entails presenting resilient, ready and combat credible space forces, forces that can withstand, fight through and recover from attacks that have the training, equipment, and sustainment capacity to conduct full spectrum operations in competition and high intensity conflict. We will achieve our resilient space order of battle by incorporating disaggregation, distribution, diversification, protection, maneuverability, and proliferation in our future force designs, starting with our missile warning and missile tracking architecture. As you likely already know, and many of you are aware in this audience, the Space Development Agency just recently launched 10 satellites as part of their tranche zero 
to demonstrate responsive, low latency communication links in a proliferated space transport layer. Follow on proliferated, proliferated layers of more than 100 tracking and custody sensors will one day make up a resilient, responsive architecture that will also provide greater fidelity and higher custody detection of missile warning threats. But the remote nature of space operations requires a pivot towards resiliency that accounts for more than just on orbit constellations. It means ground stations, networks, data, and mission critical support facilities must also enhance our ability to adapt to evolving threats and present our adversaries with targeting dilemmas. A resilient, ready, and combat credible force doesn't come out of thin air. It must be forged through a force presentation model that prioritizes threat-based advanced training and with an architecture that enables us to test our weapon systems, train our guardians, and develop and validate tactics against a realistic thinking adversary. To that end, our FY24 budget submission included 340 million to continue development of an operational test and training infrastructure. Resilient space, ground, and link segments operated by the world's most capable space forces will cause any aggressor who wishes to initiate conflict to second guess. Our second line of effort is to amplify the Guardian spirit. The Guardian spirit is a collective representation of what it means to be a member of the Space Force. Those with the Guardian spirit are principled public servants, possessing character beyond question. They are space-minded warfighters committed to mastering the profession of arms. Guardians are bold and collaborative problem solvers, exemplifying courage to debate new ideas and perpetually challenge the status quo. They continue, connect with teammates to experiment, fail, learn, adapt, and innovate, no matter the challenge. The challenge we are facing in space demand guardians who are experts, critical thinkers, and team builders. Guardians are our most important operational advantage and fielding a force with these traits is a warfighting imperative. Our third and final line of effort is partnering to win. Space power is a team sport that involves robust joint, coalition, international, interagency, academic, and commercial partnerships. Space requires global partnerships and we fully believe that our success depends on how well we integrate with the broad range of allied and partner capabilities and expertise to secure our common interests and promote shared values. Reinforced by a web of like-minded nations eager to establish and practice norms of responsible behavior, payload and data sharing agreements, wargaming and security cooperation make our partners critical force multipliers for each tenant of competitive endurance. Our acad academic partnerships also continue to expand as we discussed even with ASU. We are excited about new relationships with John Hopkins University to provide Space Force specific in residence, intermediate and senior level education for our guardians and recently announced university consortium research opportunities compromised of teams of universities addressing space, science and technology challenges. When it comes to commercial partners, the Space Force knows that we must exploit what we have, buy what we can and build only what we must. There's exciting growth in the industry right now that is driving lower launch costs, increasing our number of providers, bringing innovative technology to bear and providing mission critical services. Space Systems Command Commercial Space Office, for example, was established last year to deliver diverse and redundant commercial space services that meet joint warfighter needs. So I've covered a lot, but in closing, space is undeniably woven into our way of life and our way of war. And the importance of space for military, economic, technical, and scientific activity continues to grow rapidly. As a military service, the Space Force will defend our national security interests from the growing scope and scale of space threats with the goal of deterring crisis or conflict from extending into space. I challenge you to continue your ask hard questions and as you talk throughout the rest of today, because venues like this promote the safety, security, and sustainability of the space domain for all responsible actors. Thank you again to ASU uh, for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to your questions. Semper Super. So just indicate you have a question, and I'm more than happy to choose you. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, thank you, General mm -hmm. Bharat. I'm Namrata Goswami, and I teach at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, ASU. So uh, I was actually uh, interested if you could unpack the concept of first mover advantage, mm -hmm. because when you use a concept like that, uh, which area of space are you talking about? Is it low Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit? Is it cislunar space? Because I study China, and what I've noticed is that 
they already seem to have a first mover advantage when it comes to the lunar orbits, for example, uh, having a relay satellite and launching again next year. So the area of responsibility, a bit of that, what does the United States Space Force conceive of that? And what do you mean when you say you'll deny first mover advantage? Thank you. That is a great question. So you are exactly right. The first mover to any location is the first mover. So we talk about settling new terrain, new places. The first person there sets the uh, agenda and the rules and basically establishes. So you are correct. China has a first mover advantage when we talk about cislunar. What more I'm talking about in the competitive endurance discussion is that is what we've built in the past are very large, expensive satellites that are exquisite. And we sometimes uh, jokingly say they're very large, juicy targets uh, without any ability to defend themselves. And the amount of money it cost in the past to launch them and put them on orbit all made it very costly. And so then as a first mover, if I take out your exquisite capability, it is very difficult for you to replace that. What we're talking about is trying to build what we would call proliferated constellations, both at LEO, GEO, and MEO, such that we have varying capabilities, both military and commercial, that would allow us uh, to have that resiliency so that we could take a hit. And the first mover would not take the advantage uh, and win because we would have the ability to reconstitute, fight through that, our operators would be trained to address that, as I mentioned in combat ready forces, uh, to make that capable of happening. So that's what we're trying to do when we say deny first mover advantage. But to your point with Cislunar, first movers, when we've seen uh, exploration and various things, the first mover does get the advantage and does get to set the rules, quite frankly. Yes, sir. Oh, it's been incredible. Uh, the abilities that commercial has put forward uh, in Ukraine. And we've seen great use of both communications. Uh, they have been using uh, precision navigation and timing with GPS, uh, radar capabilities, commercial capabilities. Uh, what we have seen is what we know will happen is that commercial, uh, and we've said this for a while now, commercial, you are all the commercial industry is in the weapons engagement zone. So unlike any other domain, so if you took a picture today of the flight pattern over Ukraine, it would be a big hole because the FAA is not flying directly over Ukraine. They're flying all around it with commercial air. Well, that doesn't happen in the space domain. We share one degree boxes in geo with two or three operators stacked in a one degree orbit plane. Uh, and we operate daily responsibly together. What happens when there's a threat capability in that orbit? So whether you're commercial or military, that threat will have the opportunity uh, it could impact you. So and I don't think we in space, we have the same luxury of saying we can clear out all the non-combatants from the domain, which is why responsible counter space campaigning has to be part of our theory of success because we recognize uh, you're there in the domain with us. We're going to need you. We know we need you. And so we have to think about how we do that responsibly with the least impact to the others uh, that are in the domain as well. The access Person space, for example, the Ukrainian being able to use it as part of a, a lot of them. I think every commercial contract is unique and they are all scoped based on what you service or capability you are buying and then what is your intended use of that capability. And I think Ukraine has taught us that it will be a discussion moving forward uh, by company and that will be company to company. Uh, we play a lot with our commercial integration cell that we have out at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Uh, they participate in war games with us. They're largely a lot of SATCOM companies, but both Maxar, uh, SpaceX with Starlink uh, are also part of that organization. But those companies talk to us about how they would see that. In a fight, what would they want? Do they want to be defended? Do they not want to be defended? I will tell you, frankly, some companies would prefer to be Switzerland. I have business in both uh, entity, so therefore I don't want to pick a side. I mean, those are all valid conversations, uh, and the only way we have them are in cases like this conference and in wargaming where we sit down with partners, whether they be commercial or coalition, and say, hey, how do you feel about these things? Where, where do we see the line? Um, we've had uh, initial conversations uh, about indemnification. Are there things there legally we need to have uh, discussions about? I mean, all is on the table and in discussion, but 
again, it's to be seen and it's gonna to continue to grow the more we continue to partner and talk about it. But it is definitely an area uh, that Ukraine has made us think about and continue to war game. Yes, sir. Uh, General Burt, thank you for the great remarks. Uh, this is Dan separately from Leo Labs. Um, I was very curious about the competitive endurance uh, that theory seems like it would change the kind of mix of threats that have to be developed uh, or have to be protected against. Uh, one of the uh, specific examples that comes to mind is kind of on-orbit inspection. And back in 2020, General Raymond talked about uh, a Russian satellite tailing a U.S. national asset. And since that time, uh, we've seen Russian and uh, Chinese uh, proximity operations practiced. Uh, we've also seen the commercial side take off with Astroscale and Surrey Satellite Technologies demonstrating a kind of on-orbit debris removal and Maxar receiving a satellite-to-satellite -satellite license, imaging license from NOAA. Um, do you think uh, kind of on-orbit inspection is a threat that's that's got to be dealt with or is it going to be kind of a fact of life in the, the new space um, environment in LEO and GEO? Thank you. I think on-orbit inspection is no different than intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance in any other domain, right? I have to be able with space domain awareness to know if I image the good captain, is she a friend, foe, what is she? And if she says she's a comm satellite, is she? And there's, there's validation and verification she is who she says she is. I think when you have one satellite trailing another and I haven't declared what it is, out loud, I think you will recall, we out, out loud said the Global Space Situational Awareness Program was an ISR on orbit space domain capability, out loud. Uh, so again, we've, we've said what our capabilities are. If you are honest and say what things are and you they do and operate and have patterns of life that indicate they are what they are, then I think it's an everyday operation as it is in every domain. But when something acts out of the ordinary, that's where that first line of space domain awareness and not being operationally surprised is I will have patterned, hey, she's acting differently, what is wrong? Does she have an anomaly? Is she doing something differently? Or is she in fact not what she said she was? Um, I think that's gonna become a nature of the business as it is in every domain that you have to be able to sort what are threats and what are not, and how do you do that? I think the other dialogue that's happening across the discussion, and this goes in the entire enterprise, commercial coalition and military is, what is too close? What is uh, safety of flight and what, what's the distance I want to maintain for day-to-day -day operations? And as like you mentioned, every orbit may be very different. As I said in my speech in GEO, we have capabilities stacked up in a one degree orbit, three or four of them side by side. And they operate every day and talk to each other and have norms to maintain uh, their orbit capabilities. And LEO, that's a whole different discussion, right? As fast as we're moving and where are we at? So I, I think all of that is part of those norms and how do we decide what is too close? What is the norms? How do we all want to operate from a space traffic management, safety of flight? Uh, and then what would we consider hostile? So how many fighter pilots I got in the room? I got one in the front row, so he's gonna help me out here. If I turned, if I were a bad guy aircraft and I turned nose hot on him and lit him up with my radar, depending on the rules of engagement and where he was in the world, he has an immediate, right to self-defense. And he would start to threat react and he would be trying to take me down before I could take him down. How do we do that in space? How do we define what is hostile? That's what those norms of behaviors drive us to. I can't describe what is bad if we first haven't all agreed to what is good. So that, that's why we keep pushing on those norms of behavior and meeting with our coalition partners and working with state department and all the interagency on how do we start to establish those? And again, commercial has a voice in that. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Yes, sir. Hi, General. Uh, thank you uh, for your um, your speech this morning. I'm a former uh, Space Force employee myself. So all it's right. an honor to be here. Um, I have a question, well, two part question regarding um, really the SDA data, right? So. The first part of that question is, um, what are your thoughts on like data latency with respect to, to SDA data and how it can affect operations, especially in critical times? And the second part of that is, um, what interest is there in terms of um, using you know, the newly provided commercial um, data ar along those lines? No, that's a great question. I, I think there are a lot of, just as in every domain, there's a lot of different traffic management things that need to be accomplished. 
the day-to-day -day operations and how you operate uh, requires a certain level of latency and a certain level of fidelity on how accurate are the, the observations that you have. When we start to get down to uh, warfighting timelines and tactical timelines and how quickly must I get data uh, to any weapon system in any domain, that latency then becomes really tight, right? You, you want seconds in some case or less. And that's direct from the ability to get the targeting information directly to the shooter. Uh, space is no different. And as we start to look at this, what tasks can we use commercial? And obviously commercial is very important when we talk about uh, Department of Commerce, as all of you know, Department of Commerce uh, per the uh, NDAA was given the responsibility to take over space traffic management from the Department of Defense. We look forward to that. It's not to say that I won't continue to do space traffic management for all of my resources, uh, DOD assets, but on behalf of the Department of Defense, but absolutely we'll be partnering with Commerce uh, on how we do that. But it will allow us then to free up instead of tracking everything to only tracking the things we care about and things we believe to be threats. Uh, so I think that latency and that focus will start to change the more we get commerce on board and, and up and running in the next couple of years here, that will be very valuable to us. I also think it will help normalize the domain to those norms of behavior. But to your point of latency and commercial, I think there's opportunity to use all the assets that are out there. I want more sensors. And how do we pick and choose which sensors we use to solve which problems? And so in some cases, latency might not be bad for me, depending on how accurate it is. As compared to another, I, latency, the timing becomes more important uh, combined with that accuracy that I have to have. So how do we, we work between the two? That goes to that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's not just a slogan. We're looking at everything we do from what is inherently governmental and what is not to exploit what we have, buy what we can, and build only what we must. So commercial plays heavily even in space domain awareness and how do we continue to move forward? Thank you, ma'am, for your remarks. Uh, my name is Melissa Deswart. I'm clearly from one of your allied states. Um, I'd be really interested to hear um, some more reflections that you have about the progress of the development of the responsible behaviours and um, any observations about how we can um, really progress that. Thank you. Now, we continue to, that's a great question. We continue to meet and talk regularly uh, with our coalition space partners. Uh, as part of CSPO, which is Coalition Space Operations Group that we have, uh, partners of seven. Uh, the UK has been leading uh, the discussion on norms of behavior at the UN, and we are very supportive of that, and it's been very valuable. Uh, I think the discussion is critical because everyone that is a spacefaring nation should have a voice and be part of that, so I think the UN is the right place. Um, but I think all players have to go there. We have to continue to play them in exercises and in war games. How do they actually happen in reality. So when we say responsible counter space campaigning, how do we look at counter space campaigning such that I still do, as I said in the speech, in a responsible way? I think about long lived debris. I think about my courses of action or my options and how would I go after a counter space threat? How would I take it down in a way that would be responsible in light of all the other partners and commercial entities that are also still going to continue to operate in the domain? What's the best way to get after that? And how do you operationalize those norms? Um, most of the norms that are in that SECDEF memo, I've been a space operator for 30 years. Uh, I've grown up doing all of those things, trying uh, to operate in a safe and secure manner, disposing when needed, all those things. Uh, how do we continue to produce and work forward now as we talk about trying to work in a counter space environment? Um, partnering is a continuous operation. As I said, it's one of our three lines of effort as we move forward with the chief. Uh, we've worked very hard on that and we'll continue. We have uh, a British officer that works in my shop who's working directly uh, with us every day on those work on that work for uh, norms of behavior and we'll continue to do so. So I only see that growing tighter and tighter and with the leadership of the UK and the UN, I think we're gonna get to uh, at least some things that most of us can agree to. Uh, we may not agree to all things, but we get to most. Uh, one thing I'd offer to you, and I don't know if many of you know this, I'd rather have something than nothing. And what I mean by that is like, for example, there's a treaty on the laws of the sea. Laws of the sea is a great treaty. Did the US sign it? And we did not because we did not wanna limit our military options when it talked about mining. It said no mining the ports. So we didn't sign it, but do we follow it customarily every day? So something that is written is better than nothing because then it allows the discussion of customary law 
not just statutory law. So even if everyone won't sign the statutory law, they will come to observe over time and their behavior and it becomes norms into those things. So I think if we can get to a handful of things internationally that we can all agree to and sign up for, that is a great first step and we keep building upon that and start building that customary uh, behavior over time. Yes, sir. Virtualization of different items, and you mentioned commerce and their involvement. Uh, you mentioned commerce and their involvement with uh, uh, space aware and understanding how traffic is going to uh, come about. Um, do you want to comment on how that gets commercialized and what expectations companies should have for that? Well, I think we've got to figure out um, in every other domain, there's a way for me to have a transponder and broadcast where I am. Hi, I'm Blue. In his aircraft, he had a transponder and I could track all the aircraft. How do we get to rules of engagement where we process and transmit where our positions are? We share telemetry data uh, on where the blue assets are. And then how does that translate with traffic management? And then how do I look at areas that are tight or congested areas to make sure just as we do in air traffic management and other places, how do we do that in space where things are traffic? So I would expect Leo to be a lot busier maybe then because it's much faster moving and more congested than say geo, but that will be seen as we continue to bring commerce on. But I think commerce has that responsibility and, and is working their way very effectively toward that. Um, I think for the commercialization for all of you, it's how do you traffic in the domain just like you traffic in all the other uh, and what are the norms and rules that are set for the day-to-day -day operations. So I, yeah, I, I think we're all moving in that direction. It's just how do we get DOC stood up as quickly as we can and, and up and operational. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I I wanted to sort of maybe um, ask for clarification on challenge or challenge you on the subject of dual use technologies. So um, would LOAC or laws of armed conflict apply to outer space, particularly when we're talking about uh, satellites, right, for military and civilian use? Um, would a satellite that's currently engaged, uh, a civilian satellite engaged in conflict operations or a theater of war be subject to um, the conditions of or principles of distinction, proportionality, and so on? Um, would it be a legitimate target for an enemy force? Uh, should it prove or should it um, uh, should it prove to be one of those satellites that is of dual use, both for military and civilian use? So, for instance, SpaceX satellites are there a legitimate target for? Uh, um, for engagement, military engagement. Um, and what kinds of rules and laws would you at this particular point uh, apply to, you know, to that particular theater of war? Um, uh, would, it, would it be laws of armed conflict? Would principles of distinctions and proportionality apply? Or would you be thinking of another normative framework that would guide your response should uh, some kind of military engagement in outer space uh, with regard to satellite equipment uh, and sue in outer space. Um, just sort of uh, a question uh, to, um, to maybe clarify some of the thinking on the norms and principles of engagement when it comes to outer space. Thank you. So I'll start with the last part of your question first. And the laws of armed conflict apply to all domains. There's, there's no, hey, they only apply to these and not these. The laws of armed conflict are the laws of armed conflict. It's now how do we apply them and use them in the space domain uh, we are beholden to those uh, as well. So proportionality, all the things you were you're saying, all absolutely apply. Uh, that goes into the decision calculus of them. What is our response options that we present uh, to the commander? Uh, the other piece I would say too, when we talk about responses uh, to a threat in space, they're not all space answers. So I choose the time and place of my choosing as a commander of a fighting organization on how I will respond to an enemy action. So that could be in an air, land, or sea domain response to a space attack, for example. So I often get concerned that everyone assumes that an attack in space means we go right to fighting in the space domain, per se. So all of those options are on the table. Um, to your second point, when you talk about uh, commercial capabilities, and for example, what we are seeing in Ukraine, I, I think from a commercial perspective, this was the conversation I was having 
uh, with General Schmidl up here, and his question was, when you have a military that is seeking commercial capability and looking to augment its capabilities with commercial, you are now on a commercial asset. The discussion becomes, I'm doing military operations using that commercial uh, satellite. Would my enemy see that commercial satellite as a target? I would argue yes, if I am using it as the US military, which is why we've been having commercial satellite companies, satellite communications companies in particular, in many of our war games to talk through these conversations about how we're using them. We use them day to day. This isn't like just in a wartime environment, we're using commercial capabilities all the time. Uh, so how does the enemy view those in trying to deny us those space enabled capabilities? So uh, I would say that's a conversation that we have to have and we have to go in eyes wide open if that in fact could be a target, how would we defend it? Uh, or would we, would the commercial company say, I would like to withdraw, uh, I do not wanna be a target, I would ask you to, to withdraw my contract. Those are all options on the table. Uh, and again, by contract, that will be written, as I said earlier, I think we're going to have to be smarter as we work through contracts. Hey, you would like to contract my commercial capability. What are you going to do with it? And that becomes part of the discussion on whether I want to contract with the Department of Defense or I don't, because that's a, a contractual relationship we have to agree to. Uh, and it can't just be, hey, in peacetime, here's where we are. What happens when we start fighting? Both of those conversations kind of have to happen, I think, for that partnership commercially to be effective. Uh, so going in eyes wide open on that. Uh, but you can see in Ukraine, I mean, anything that they believe the Ukrainians are using, the Russians are trying to take away from them to make it more difficult. They're trying to own the ultimate high ground. So it, it's evident that uh, commercial is on the table and they're going at commercial communications, whether that be from cyber. So again, may not be uh, electronic warfare, electronic jamming. Uh, they have not done anything physicality wise, but they have actually gone electronic warfare uh, non kinetically with both cyber and on the space based capabilities to deny them. But it is a conversation we have to continue to have. And again, these are the forums where, where we have to keep talking about that. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Roland Hi, from Kratos. How are you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> Uh, earlier, you mentioned about norms and behaviors and uh, working with ally partners uh, and having that being guided and facilitated through United Nations. One of the bigger questions is what is going to be or potentially uh, who is going to be the governing body to help enforce those norms and behaviors? Is there any conversations going on with the UN right now to discuss who would be the governing body? So I would ask you, who's the governing body for anything that's directed by the UN? And I just say that I'm not saying that to be disrespectful in any way to the UN. What I'm trying to say is that like-minded nations come to the table and create either statutory or customary laws that they follow uh, and operate under. And if those are breached in any way or disregarded, then it is to what? level do the like-minded nations decide they should band together and hold that individual uh, actor accountable. And so I think that's what's going to be important. As I said earlier, I have to define good before I can then hold accountable bad. I also have to be able to attribute bad, which is why space domain awareness is so critical to be able to say, hey, we said these are the ways we operate. We have just seen actor X do this in the domain and here's what that caused. How would we like to respond as like-faring nations, like-minded nations? That will be a coalition of the willing, as is every coalition. Uh, so, I, I mean, I hear you. I, I, again, I think something written down and we start to follow both uh, statutorily and customarily is better than where we are now, where we don't have a lot of guidance and a lot of norms documented, and we continue to work and evolve from there. I think I'm getting close on time. I haven't seen my five minute warning guy. Ma'am, uh, Bruno D'Souza, uh, George Washington University visiting scholar, ma'am. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, a follow up question on, you, you spoke partnering, partnering to win. I was just wondering what role you see NATO uh, in uh, playing in this, in this regard. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, NATO has proved to be a great partner and we have seen nothing but strength in how we have responded as a coalition in Ukraine. We have the NATO Space Operations Center there at Ramstein. 
Uh, we've continued to start building that capability out. Uh, we are on the cusp of standing up uh, the European Command Space Force component, uh, which will obviously be very critical in that engagement uh, as part of NATO there in Europe. Uh, so we're continuing to look for ways to solidify our space engagements uh, and how we have not only boots on the ground uh, at NATO with the NATO Space Ops Center, but also with the service component to US European Command uh, as they engage directly every day uh, in Europe as well. So I, I think the, that relationship only continues to solidify uh, and move in the right direction. Hi, ma'am. Good morning. I appreciate your comments. Uh, my name is Joanna, Lieutenant Commander Joanna Gonzalez. I'm at OGCI. I have one question just because um, you've mentioned a couple of times that we have to define you know, what is good in order to hold actors accountable. Um, given recent events in the past, right, regarding China and Russia's behavior with debris, we, we've seen those actions place, you know, our astronauts in danger. Yep. And so my question is, we know that behavior is bad. So what, what do you think we can do to deter that behavior? Well, I think we have said uh, Vice President Harris last summer, I had the pleasure to host her at Vandenberg last year, and we made our statement as the National Space Council and as a nation that we would not do uh, ASAT testing, as we saw both the Chinese and the Russians do in those two previous cases. We have said we will not do that as a nation. Uh, we will not do kinetic tests. So I think that's important to, to say that that is a norm we consider you should not needlessly create long-lived debris. It's irresponsible. Uh, I think the other pieces go to some of the questions we've gotten today. How close is too close? How do we operate together? How are we transparent about the mission sets we are doing? Uh, when we are needed to be disposed of. So just like good General Schmidl, he will hit bingo fuel, he must go home. He runs out of gas if he doesn't, unless there's a tanker to help him out. Same thing on orbit. Once I get to a certain gas level, I need to dispose of the capability. So th there are all these norms of behaviors that over the years, again, I've grown up doing as a space operator. It's how do we work uh, as like-minded nations to all of us operate and exhibit those behaviors. So then when it isn't that way, then we have a discussion with the UN and how are we going to uphold when it's not done that way. Uh, the other piece I would say too that we've been talking about and is it a commercial service is what we would call uh, servicing. So that's either refueling, the trash pickup truck, the tow truck, but this goes back to the discussion the young lady in the back asked me about dual use. So again, if I have a tow truck uh, satellite that takes away dead satellites in orbit, that could also be construed as something that could be a weapon, right? Because I can reach out and grab your satellite and take it to an unusable orbit. Um, so I think we have to be very careful in those lines of distinction. Uh, and I think commercials going to overtime need these same capabilities for refueling, for debris removal, for dead satellite removal. If something unexpectedly dies on orbit uh, and it's not about gas, it's they had an unexpected failure and they die. Uh, those things happen. How do, how do we make those get out of very valuable space on orbit? So I, I think those are the kinds of things I think commercially that we could get after the servicing. Uh, we're having conversations about it and how we would do it and again, keep that separation. But I think it is important uh, to everyone in the domain. So I, where's my green piece for space? Hi, uh, Kevin Marcherson with Honeywell. Um, I was at a conference yesterday and a Department of State person was talking about Artemis Accords and negotiating some of these similar things from a civil and commercial standpoint. Is that something, a framework that we can build on for, as you mentioned, having something written down? Uh, what types of other vehicles might uh, come out of that and how would state be part of your discussion? I think Artemis is a great uh, operation led by NASA. Uh, and I think that coalition of spacefaring nations to explore uh, and do great things is absolutely uh, another type of agreement we need to continue to foster as a nation uh, across the board. Anytime we can partner with other like-minded nations, whether it be for space exploration, in the military, uh, for other efforts, always good. But in this case, that is purely a NASA civil agreement. That's not a, a DOD agreement, if you will. But I do see value in, again, the partnership uh, and the working together to get to the moon and do that in a, in a quick and safe way uh, that many of us can all prosper from. Uh, I think anytime we can create those kinds of agreements, it's value added to us. But again, 
that's a, a different agreement from uh, the Department of Defense. And so I would just say I, I, I look forward uh, to Artemis and watching it be successful in getting to the moon uh, and the technologies that I will hopefully get to uh, be a proud recipient of. Because anytime we've had a space program, all of us in our way of life, uh, we get great technologies and capabilities that come from that exploration and how we use it every day. Uh, but the more and more we can do those uh, relationships, the better. Uh, and with different agencies and different people. So in some cases, uh, why I think those are important is uh, the Chinese military to military may not want to talk to me. Not a surprise, but they might talk from a civil or a commercial or in some other fashion or through another partner. So I may have a partner that's also able to talk to them and as a partner with them. Is that a great relationship? Absolutely. You want to be able to keep the conversation and the dialogue alive. That's what competition is about. How you keep talking and talking and working through it and, and working through the issues. If you're not talking, how do you ever know what the issues are and how do we work together uh, to get past those? So I think Artemis Accord bottom line is a great thing. I think NASA is doing great work. We need to keep looking for other opportunities in every venue to partner with our international partners uh, and even China and Russia where we can. Yes, sir. Uh, General Bird, Eric Brown from Lockheed Martin. Um, you've mentioned the Allied coordination several times, and historically, we've looked at them, you know, largely from an interoperability standpoint on things like space support operations. Increasingly, we're seeing them, to, you know, investing significantly more in their space capabilities. How do you see the coordination going forward in the areas of protect and defend or space superiority? both from the standpoint of operations as well as their capability development. Absolutely. So when we talk about uh, our partner to win line of effort, that is also involved with our chief space requirements officer. So the guys who are looking at all of our future programs, our force designs, we're having conversations with the allies on what are they looking to build? What would they like to invest in? What is the vision moving forward? We play that a lot in war gaming because we can look at future capes and concepts and what we're looking to invest to. Uh, for all the nations, we just had Shriver War Game back in March. Uh, so very successful uh, dialogue about where we see ourselves moving forward. And then how do those play in norms of behavior as well, and that they're done responsibly. Uh, so I think all the nations are working their way there. The second piece would be just like any other domain, we have foreign military sales. Uh, and that goes both ways, right? Um, so I, I think we've seen it in the air domain. We've, we've sold F-35s, we've bought a JSTARS, uh, E7 replacement. I mean, we've, we've seen that in other domains where they have bought some of our capabilities. We have bought theirs. Uh, I only see that continuing to grow in the space domain. We've done uh, hosted payloads, uh, which Japanese QZSS is one we just recently signed. So, I mean, I, I see that continuing to evolve uh, and grow, but it has to grow in the way they want to invest and how they see the future of their space capabilities uh, with ours. And how does our force design and theirs take advantage of each other's capabilities so that we're building uh, together and interoperable, as we do in every domain. Thanks again for your comments earlier. Um, nobody's asked you what are your what are your big rocks? What are keeping you up at night? What are those quick hitters that you'd say industry would best work? Uh, I, the one I, I, I think we're really going after proliferated, Leo. We've, we've cracked launch. You guys are, the industry is doing an amazing job with lowering the cost of launch. It's now, what do I put on the end of that launch? How do I start to get to proliferated constellations, capabilities that can be quickly uh, used in that discussion of denying the first mover advantage? Um, multiple, uh, small, low-cost launches. How do we get to those kinds of payloads? And the one that we don't talk about enough, and I briefly talked about it in the speech, was Space is not just about the shiny objects on orbit. It's also about the ground system, the data links that connect them and the receivers. And so I would like to live in a world where all of that is reprogrammable and software based and customizable to include the crypto. Because if I can keep evolving software, both on the ground, on the satellite and in the receiver, I'm moving very quickly. So I'll give you a SATCOM example. Most receivers are built for unique satellite communications receivers. I would like to get to where, if, if we could get to where it's a band, so if it's uh, SHF, for example, or UHF, can I use military and can I quickly, if denied, go to the commercial capability? How do I do that? So there's some programming in the, the licensing and there's some stuff there that's in the software itself to be able to do that, but that to me seems functional. How, how do we do that? But the, the, the receivers and the ground systems can't be stovepiped to individual capabilities. They have to be multi-use and the ability 
uh, to use whatever's in view uh, to provide that resiliency that we need. Thank you. Um, so a little bit ago, like two questions ago, you mentioned um, active debris removal. Um, what are your thoughts on like active collision avoidance uh, along the lines of that same question? Active collision, collision bombardments is that avoidance. Collision oh. avoidance. So I mean, I guess not really like you know tell your operator move their satellite, but more I guess autonomous or onboard versions. processing. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, we recognize, uh, especially with proliferated constellations, I think it's become very evident that there needs to be some level of onboard collision avoidance especially with the number of satellites that you have in a particular constellation, uh, as well as from debris and other capabilities, other things that, uh, you know, that you can't control that are in the domain. So I think artificial intelligence, the ability for them to self-control and to self-heal will be absolutely important as we look at mesh networks uh, and the communications capabilities uh, that we're looking to field here in the future uh, with the Space uh, Development Agency. Those are all capabilities that are being included uh, in those designs. There is a question online, so I will read it. Um, this is from Red Bugma, uh, Bugar, Bumgar. Sorry. Um, the question um, is how much of the collaboration spirit from the US Space Force is visible from China? Who and which entity do you interact with in China, if any? That's a good question. So I'll give you my personal example. So as the commander of the Combined Force Space Component Command out of Annenberg Space Force Base today until Department of Commerce takes over, uh, is responsible for all the space traffic management uh, across the globe. Uh, the two things that we care most about are the souls that are on orbit, not only on the ISS, but also the TACO knots that are on the Chinese space station. So we are sending every day, if there is a collision, potential collision with the Chinese space station, that is being sent directly uh, to our equivalents in the organization. Uh, on the Chinese side. So that is put out, it's put out on spacetrack.org. We have the information available to them as well to see what we are reporting against. Um, we get no response. Not thank you, have a nice day, nothing. So I think there is a lot of opportunity where we want to talk, we are trying to communicate uh, and that is not what is wanted. So uh, I think we have to, so again, I, and, and let's be honest, okay, so if, the Chinese called me and told me to move a satellite. I would say thank you for your input to national security, but I would also double check that that in fact is a threat to me before I moved it, right? I would confirm, I would trust but verify, okay? The same concept there, so I get it. Uh, that's why I say it's so important for Artemis and these other types of relationships. How do we keep working ways to talk to other people and to each other and get different ideas? We may not all agree, that's okay, but at least we're talking. And I think that is important. Um, so I, like I said, we are attempting, but there is, there is not a uh, response there. Oh, here we go. One more in the back. Yeah, so a very thought provoking answer. So when you were answering, there were two questions that came to mind, especially the United Nations concept. So there seems to be a lack of consensus where it comes to norms of behavior as well. And what is of a concern of mine is that major spacefaring nations are not agreeing. For example, even on an anti-satellite weapon ban, right? So India abstained, as you know, and China and Russia voted against it. So I would be interested in thoughts on, I do understand the real politic of it, but uh, coming from a leader like you, why do you think, for example, a country like India, should consider uh, joining such a moratorium because it has, as you know, tested an anti-satellite weapon in 2019. And the second question is, uh, we do talk a lot about the lack of uh, current agreement on what is proximate, for example, in space, what is considered safe and what is not considered space. But from your perspective, do you have an operational idea of what is considered safe and what is considered uh, not safe? Thank you. No, to your first question, I mean, every nation is going to want to have sovereign sovereignty and make decisions as they see fit. So I, I, I would not presume to understand why India is choosing not to be a part of the consortium or not voting against it or having a stay. That, that's not for me to know. That's for their nation, their senior leaders to discuss. 
Uh, but I think, as I mentioned to you, we, we didn't sign laws of the seas, but we follow it. So I, again, I think something written down is better than nothing. And getting some to agree to something, again, is better than nothing written down. So I think we have to start somewhere. Uh, and I think that's important. Um, and I'm sorry, remind me your second question again. So uh, we continue to discuss a lot about okay, the- yeah, how close is too close, got it. Um, <laughs> Um, I think it depends on the orbit, and that's, I know, not a very satisfying answer. So in low Earth orbit, when you're traveling extremely fast, being uh, closer and tighter together is a lot more uh, disconcerting. It's also different in how you plane change. So I'll use the example of the Russian satellite that General Raymond talked about in 2020. That So when we are in a plane in, in low Earth orbit, the amount of energy and gas it requires to do a plane change uh, is pretty pretty distinct and it doesn't seem like it until you do the math, but that capability plane matched, we moved and it plane matched again. So is that hostile? These are the kinds of, of dialogues that we have to have because if it's tracking me and it appears to be a weapon or has a weapon or there's intelligence, there's a weapon on board that capability, then that is a concern. Uh, when we talk about day-to-day -day operations, and I know what you are, and we're at GEO, and we're all satellite capabilities, communications capabilities, I'm just worried about deconflicting our frequencies, and we're all out there working together and maintaining uh, safe distance from each other. But we will probably be a lot tighter in GEO than I would be in low Earth orbit, right? So it's going to be, it depends on what orbit we're talking about and what I believe that other capability to be on how close I would want it or not want it to be to me. Something that has a robotic arm, probably want to stay really far away from it. I do not want it getting next to me to be able to grapple it or touch my satellite. So again, it's all going to depend. Uh, the other piece of this that comes in, we talked about resiliency and denying that first mover advantage. What is my ability to run or move or maneuver? So in some cases, I may have a lot of gas. Some cases they don't have a lot of gas. Some cases I'm really big and I'm a big juicy target. In other cases, I'm more agile and smaller and have more maneuverability. All of that is gonna play into what is too close. So I, I wish I could give you a more substantive, like it's this number, I, but I can't, because it, it will depend on a case by case basis as it does uh, in every other domain based on what is approaching me. Three minutes, last question. That's right, maybe Bob. Oh, I'll ask the last question real quick here. So after all the discussion this morning, with regard to the students at ASU, um, there's a lot of interest in this initiative, a lot of interest in what we're doing. Is there anything that you could recommend uh, on two fronts? One, in terms of study topics, a number of us get asked to mentor master's papers and things like that. And the second thing is, what if the students are interested in potentially serving and getting into the Space Force? Can you give us a little bit of an insight sure, into how absolutely. they might do that and what they might study while they're undergraduates or graduates now? Okay, I'll start with how to join Space Force first. Um, <laughs> um, we're looking for STEM degrees, but we'll take, we were looking for, uh, as I mentioned in the Guardian Spirit, uh, our four core values, character, courage, connectedness, and commitment. Uh, we're looking for examples of that when they put their uh, applications in and how they've uh, lived that within uh, their college experience or their life experience. Uh, obviously, STEM degrees, we have a board. Uh, it's very competitive to meet. Um, we typically take on about 800 a year, both officer and enlisted. Of the officer, it's a little less. It's about 200 to 250, so a smaller number. So what I would say is coming out of college, if you want to enlist or come into the Space Force, there are boards that happen to apply for what we would call officer training school uh, that are online. You can go to the spaceforce.gov site and we've got all that information. So or spaceforce.mil, we've got those and you can post, find the information for application. Uh, but those are the STEM degrees, living the four core values uh, and examples of that and, and pushing forward, but very competitive, I can tell you. And if, if you come into the Space Force, uh, we have, uh, we only brought to the Space Force the operational missions that support the Space Force. So think satellite operations, 13 Sierras, uh, intelligence, cyber, uh, cyber operations, uh, the cyber defense and the operations of those space capabilities uh, and acquisition uh, are the capabilities that we brought to the Space Force uh, that we operate with uh, every day. So those would be the types of jobs that uh, you would come to if you came into the Space Force, whether officer uh, or enlisted. Um, for the things that I would ask you to study, so I think you heard me talk a little bit about servicing. I'd be curious, 
You know, what does academia think and how do you think a way that we could look at servicing uh, and getting after that? Um, the second, cyber defense continues to be a concern that we all have. How do we do that uh, across the board? Um, the space traffic management and these norms of behaviors and discussions, are there things we could take from history and other domains? Uh, you know, the other domains, I always talk about space was built backward. Uh, other domains had entrepreneurs. So think Orville Wright, Henry Ford. Think of people who built the capabilities first and the military then saw them and said, ooh, I'll put some armor on that or I'll add a gun. And now it becomes something and it's militarized. In this case, it started as part of the space race and the Cold War. And just now, because of the cost of entry, are we seeing the rapid expansion of the commercial enterprise? So it, I, I think it's a little bit different. So how do you how do you do some research of historically and, and what could we think about uh, for the domain? I think Cislunar is, is an amazing look uh, and there's a lot of work to be done there about how do we go to the moon? How do we stay? What do we do? How do we think about the, the real politic of the moon and who gets there first and what does that mean? Uh, and then just publishing on space topics. I would tell you across the board, uh, we don't talk about the domain uh, in terms that an, a normal taxpayer can understand. Uh, and sometimes it gets very confusing to them when we get really, uh, I jokingly say, geektacular. We're talking about orbits and orbitology and rick frames, and we get really into that stuff. Uh, and, you know, I try to make sure that when we're talking in public, that we're, we're having conversations that everyday people can understand who may not be in the business. Uh, and I think the more we can publish and get the, the American people understanding what the importance of space is and why, and that comes through academia and publishing and publishing from our part as well on the issues and concerns, I think is really important. Well, that's great, General Borton. We appreciate that and appreciate your comments this morning and the fact that you came here to oh. spend your morning with us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, General Bird. Once again, really appreciate all your insights and comments. So we'll take a short 15 minute break. Uh, hope you all stick around for, for the entire day, but coffee break, and then we'll resume in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Hey, Joe. There goes all of our talking points. Oh, no, it's good. There's always something to talk about. That's good. Yeah. That was all right. Say what? Yes. Uh, this one, this one just yeah, that's fell on the floor. It's a built up. Yeah, good. Okay, so I'm gonna use this one initially, to, or I can use either one. Doesn't matter. Yeah, either one is fine. Rich here was just commenting on how stunned he was at, uh, that uh, for it took 45 minutes. That's awesome. No, but more, more importantly, that, that there were that many questions. Because usually you go to settings and there's people to ask questions. Oh, no. And this was a very excellent question. Yeah. Covered a lot of ground. So, so far, so, very good. So, the, again, the reason that I wanted to get to is because she is going to draw all the interesting people because well, the way they make their money is by connecting with people like her and the opportunity that folks can do that. And the other thing is, I have heard from Mike Holmes that she is a great public speaker, very engaged, and so I kind of figured this was.
All right, it is 1030. If everyone will please rejoin their seats, we're gonna get started with our first panel discussion. If you can please return to your seats, we're going to get started. Thank you. Bob is back. Yeah. And I just put some paper down if you want it. And then as far as the microphone, you need this, you're gonna go. No, I'll, I'll hold it for questions. So I'll take that. Does that, does that work for you? Uh, absolutely. All right. <laughs> How about now? <laughs> That's why Terrence in charge of this program and not me. Okay. So first of all, I uh, just want to again thank you all for coming this morning and uh, and asking uh, General Burt some really good and uh, probing and pointed questions. That was a great discussion we had with her this morning. We were just talking about this up here. You know, having done many events like this when I was in uniform it's not always the case that you get a really engaged audience that's asking tough questions and so that was uh, that was great and i know she appreciated that and i know she appreciated the chance to get out of the pentagon for a couple hours we are going to conduct today a series of panels and and the background on the panels is ostensibly the first one we're going to discuss space as a domain right so uh, this mirrors many of the conversations we had when we stood up cyber command and we were trying to figure out how to operate in the quote world of cyber and what was a domain what did it mean to be a domain etc cetera, etc cetera. and initially it seemed to me when i first started doing this with cyber command that it was kind of a it was really a question that was in search of of uh, of, of some substance i couldn't understand why we got wrapped around the axle about this and then i began to attend uh, a series of deputy committee meetings in the white house with people that were not exposed to the world of cyber at all. And it quickly became apparent to me that understanding the domain in which we were operating became absolutely critical to helping us establish uh, cyber policy and to understand the issues that we were dealing with. So that's kind of what drove the discussion or the, the, the title of this panel. At, with this panel, as well as all the other ones that you see today, you're going to see a mix of people from industry, from academia, from government, from think tanks. That is all very intentional. The, the hope is to bring different perspectives to the, the, uh, to the problems that, that we're dealing with today. And as General Burt mentioned this morning, and she went on to discuss it again and again, the input of industry, the input on the commercial side, the input of academia, all of that is coming together with government. And so this, uh, this sort of triumvirate of, uh, of perspectives is actually the way we're gonna go forward. So that's why they're set up the way they are today. I would also encourage you not to feel confined by the, the title of the panel. So we're talking about domain, we're gonna talk about law, the, law of space, if you will, in the next panel, and then deterrence at the end of the, at the last panel of the day. And as you all know, those three panels are going to all flow together in terms of the, the discussions and the things that we're going to talk about. So I would encourage you to, uh, to ask the kind of questions of the, of the experts that we've got up here today that are of interest to you and, and not feel confined, if you will, by trying to stay to the particular topic that we're talking about, okay? So I realize that that's a dangerous precedent to set, but we're gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna go with it this morning and see how it works. Maybe at lunch, uh, I'll, I'll be told to change that. Either Jessica or Taryn are gonna straighten me out on that. So the first panel we're gonna talk about this morning is about uh, domain awareness. And the way we're gonna do this, I'm just gonna do a very brief introduction. And then I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to give us three to five minutes of what they are in their particular area of expertise, what they are most concerned about right now, what they're focused on and what their interests are and what they're hoping to get out of the dialogue that we have today in this, uh, in this discussion. So uh, the, the first one that, uh, one of the panel, the first panelist is uh, Chris Johnson and he is a, uh, 
the Space Law Advisor at the Secure World Foundation, but he is also a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and co-teaches a space law seminar. So we, we have somebody that has a deep, deep knowledge of, the, of space law. He is a core expert and rule drafter in a project uh, that he's going to have to give you the, they, they gave me the acronym, but they didn't tell me what it means. So I'll let you sort that out in Malamos later on. Uh, and he serves on the board of directors of the Space Agency Advisory Council. So Chris is going to, is, is with us this morning. Uh, in addition to Chris on the panel here is uh, Charles Galbraith. And Charles is a, uh, at, from the Mitchell Institute of Aerospace Studies. Uh, he's a senior resident fellow for space studies. And the Mitchell Institute uh, is actually run by a friend of mine, Dave Deptula. And they have uh, recently really leaned into the space portfolio that they have there. Uh, Charles is a retired Space Force Colonel. So he's got some, some operational bona fides here. He's got 30 years of experience in a variety of space operations, acquisition, test, and staff uh, uh, positions. Uh, including he was the Deputy Chief Technology and Innovation Officer on the headquarters United States Space Force staff. So pretty significant. He was the one that was trying to figure out how they were going to create and field innovative technologies in the world of Space Force. So that, that's a person who that's a, an area of expertise of his. In addition, he has deployed uh, to Afghanistan as the space liaison to the ISAF headquarters and was an Air Force fellow with RAND. So uh, again, deep expertise on this. The third member of our panel down at the end, uh, Joseph Cox. Joe is a cybersecurity lead for the FedSim Sentinel program. He uh, has a, uh, performs research on collaborative autonomous cybersecurity. So across the space ecosystem. So again, General Burt mentioned this morning how tightly connected the space and cyber worlds are. And, and I can vouch for that. I saw the same thing from the, from the cyber side. Uh, while he was on active duty with the Air Force, Joe was a physicist assigned in satellite communications, weapons development, space radar, and missile defense. Um, he was uh, held numerous positions. He was a chief engineering of space systems and the associate director of the Space Knowledge Center. He has a master's degree in laser optics and a CPhil in astrophysics and uh, 14 publications in remote sensing astrophysics and space technology. So kind of a bona fide rocket scientist. So these are the folks that are on the panel this morning. And again, the way we're going to conduct this, so I'm gonna have each one of them just give some introductory remarks and then we're gonna throw it open for questions. The hope is we're gonna treat this more like a workshop and have a dialogue of what is of interest to you and uh, to, to query the panel here. And so with that, we will move forward. And Charles, since you're the first one there, you can start off. All right, thank you, General. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to ASU for hosting this event. Uh, you've been incredible hosts, uh, very generous in, in uh, bringing together this team. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanna amplify a couple of the comments that General Burt made this morning about the competition, this gray zone area that we're in. Is that not working? All right. Is this better? Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, just wanted to amplify a couple of the comments that General Burt made this morning. Uh, she talked about the competition that we're in and we wanna stay in. Uh, this gray zone area where there are actors like Russia and China that are taking actions against um, satellites on a daily basis. General Thompson's talked about, who's the vice chief of space operations has talked about daily activities from Russia and China, lazing, cyber attacks, RF jamming of, of our space capabilities. So what does that mean for a potential conflict in space? Um, so space domain awareness, understanding what is going on is absolutely critical in this gray zone competition. Um, General Burke talked about the need to put things into uh, a language that everybody can understand. So for the pilots in the room, guardians <laughs> operate satellites uh, basically flying on instruments only all the time, right? And they do that with data that is not real time. So can you imagine flying an aircraft, instruments only all the time with data that is not current? Um, it's, it's okay if the environment you're in is benign and there aren't threats to it, but that's not the reality today. Uh, and so we absolutely need to increase our space domain awareness 
with additional sensors uh, to observe what's going on in key regions of space and around key assets in space. Uh, but it's not just about the sensors, it's about making sense of those sensors data. And so the ability to transport that information, the ability to apply uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to that data to understand patterns of life, to keep track of threats, uh, to identify potential courses of action for decision makers. Because let's not kid ourselves, we don't collect data in space just to go, oh, that's, that's nice. Uh, we do it to inform decision makers, to give them options about how to respond. So can we provide actionable information to decision makers in time for them to make relevant and credible decisions. That's really what it comes down to. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this panel. Uh, what I wanna get out of this is just the continuation of, of the discussion and to get diversity of thought because this is a complex problem. Um, space warfare, space domain awareness, uh, continued development of norms. This is, this is, there's a lot of complexity here. And so understanding the different perspectives and being able to openly discuss those uh, in a forum like this is just a great opportunity. So thank you. All right, well, good morning, everyone, or time appropriate greeting to those who are watching us online. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Space Law Advisor at Secure World. And you mentioned the Milamos Manual, the manual on international law applicable to military activities in outer space. This is one of two manuals, at least two manuals, which is looking at the uh, the rules that we have that exist right now, what we call the lex lata, the law as it is made, and seeing how it applies to, say, conflict in the space domain. As our first speaker pointed out quite correctly, that law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, of course, applies to the space domain because it applies to all domains where humans are conducting uh, armed conflict. Um, so with that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, domains and what we think about the space domain or potentially multiple domains. Um, personally, for me, when I think about space uh, and I think about the rules that are applicable there and how those rules actually apply, well, the physics are different, whether, you know, and the, the actors are different if we're at LEO or medium Earth orbit or uh, out to geo. They're, of course, different again when we go to other locations, when we go to celestial bodies, uh, you know, cislunar. So I see that there, I think that there are, in fact, multiple domains and not even to mention the, the domain of radio frequency and that, the, the use of that, the use of, of the spectrum. These are different domains. And I think that I don't want to say that space is special as compared to other domains like terrestrial domains, because I think each domain is unique. Um, but I wanted to kind of think a little bit about the utility of having analogies between domains and say, well, space is just like the oceans or space is just like international airspaces, or it's similar to the Antarctic or it's similar to cyberspace or it's similar to the deep seabed, et cetera, et cetera. We, I think we try and analogize between this domain and that domain. Well, kind of to take, maybe to take shortcuts and to simplify our thinking. And it feels good to say, I think I, I know how that new domain works because I can compare it to this other domain that I know a bit more about. And we do this when we teach space law. You know, space sometimes is taught with cyber, sometimes it's taught with remote sensing, sometimes it's taught with aviation, like air law and space law. So I think that, yes, there are, util there are benefits in comparing from domains, but I, I, I always want to question whether those comparisons, those analogies really work out, really play out, because I think that there will be things which are unique to the space domain. For example, just for example, um, well, responsible behavior or what triggers the right of self-defense. This is different than what happens on Earth. Uh, what is um, responsible behavior? What is long-lived, let's say, collisions or debris creation? If you destroy something on Earth uh, in the context of an international armed conflict, you hit a target, the debris falls to the ground. You know, you hit, destroy a building, it falls down. You destroy something on orbit, that debris can be incredibly long-lived and can stretch out to encompass the Earth. It can stretch out in three dimensions. So. Therefore, these requirements, necessity, distinction, proportionality, and humanity, when we think about them in here on Earth, well, they're going to be definitely absolutely different in the space domain because the consequences of what you do play out differently because it's a different domain. So 
I, I always have some type of anxiety about like comparing and contrasting between domains. Um, and as we do want to talk a little bit about and set up one of our later panels, international law and space law. Um, well, what I teach and what I'm always focused on uh, is international space law, which begins with the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which has many principles, uh, which yes, they are, some of them we can say are vague, and at the same time they are binding. So when we talk about Article 9, which says that states should be guided by the principles of cooperation and mutual assistance, and shall conduct all of their activities with due regard to the corresponding interests of other states, and shall uh, um, not cause harmful contamination of the space domain, and have a further obligation, a positive obligation, to take appropriate measures to not cause harmful contamination of the space domain. Yes, the, what I've just said is vague, uh, as vague requirements and obligations, and at the same time, they are binding. So we have to think through how they apply, and they do apply, and they constrict our actions. Uh, and um, we have this basis of international space law that guides our principles. Um, and via Article 3, the rest of international law, which I also mentioned, um, also applies to the space domain. So all of those things we mentioned uh, about uh, public international law and law of armed conflict, they also are applicable to the space domain, even if we know we don't know exactly how they will play out, exactly what self-defense looks like, exactly what proportionality and distinction look like, and how they are different in the space domain. So while it is true we have decades of international space law beginning with the Outer Space Treaty, how they will actually play out what they actually mean has, is yet to be determined. And in fact, there's a lot of space law to be made, a lot of uh, the lege ferenda, the law which is yet to be made. And to do that, to create this new these sets of new laws which we'll have for the space domain, it's quite easy to think of our short-term interests of what we want to do this year, what we want, or what we want to protect our assets, and you know, uh, foster competition, foster national industry. It is also critical to not just think about your short-term interests, but your long-term interests, and in fact, your values, long-term interests of fostering peaceful uses, fostering sustainability, fostering you know neighbor neighborless neighborliness between actors. We have to think through not just you know what we want to do today, but what values we want to adhere to in the space domain and exhibit for others. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So let's get started. Uh, so I'm Joe Cox from Lidos, as uh, was mentioned, and I do work in say, space cybersecurity. I'm proud to throw my pocket protector in the ring here as one of the, the only nerd on the panel. I know there's a couple of us, but uh, I was talking to the executive vice president of Lidos in October 2021. I want to point this out. And I, this is somewhat hyperbolic, but I said, for space cybersecurity, you could spend a week reading everything of substance that's in the public domain. Because it really, there's newspaper articles saying space cybersecurity is really important, and there's magazine articles, but what is there of substance? Now, within a month, that was wrong. Now, today, uh, I could easily lose track, and I do. I have to catch up because there's so much that's out there that's of substance. And one thing I want to point out we talk about academia and government, military, and industry, but we don't talk about FRDCs and UARCs. And they've been very, very fundamental in propelling space cybersecurity and protecting the United States. So I just want to point that out. Uh, we all work in in collegiate you know environment with uh, with FRDCs, aerospace and MITRE corporation, particularly in the cyber domain, have been been absolutely awesome. Now to throw my pocket protector in here, uh, I want to talk about sensing real quickly. Uh, sensing to me, sensing is a search for phenomenology, algorithm modalities. That's what we're looking for. And so we do find data and data is very important, but to get knowledge out of that, we have to search for those modalities. And I think that one of the best things an industry can do is to apply its intellectual talent to find those. So part of the cybersecurity realm, part of SDA, you know, it's, all, it's all related to, to sensing and finding the right knowledge and, and then hopefully informing with those modalities what future sensing we could do. And some of the collaboration we could do around the world is specifically to get the data to perform those that work. Uh, a few things I want to point out about timeliness, because I'm a cyber person, you know, and, and, and I'm not a combat operator, I was a, I was a military acquisition puke, the uh, person, uh, the, got to be careful with my audience here, you know, the Boydian OODA loops are the important aspect in conflict, and what timeliness does, it helps us tighten our OODA loops, our observe, orient, decide, act loop, 
so we can get within the enemy's decision cycle. Now, I know we're talking about preventing war, but we also have to prepare for it. And by preparing for it and being strong about it, we hopefully can prevent it. But the, the cyber aspect of space is timeliness is a, a key ingredient there. And not only does, uh, you know, an inaccuracy in timing could prevent the a common operational picture being developed and, and so on. So one of the aspects that I'm really worried about keeps me up at night is a timing architecture in space and how an attack against that might be super critical. I think that's something that's overlooked. So I want to point that out. We, like I said, something of substance, maybe that's a, a place we can kind of grab onto. And I, space domain awareness is not just about knowing what our adversaries are, are, are doing per se. Uh, it's attribution, specifically attribution, making sure that adversaries aren't using proxies to, to start a war. We have to know right away what nation is performing an action and make sure that we're not being spoofed, all right? And cyber gets in that place because cyber is part of the electronic order of battle for adversaries. So I need to know if there's a cyber attack on one satellite that that's not a prelude to some other action, that there is correlation, but maybe not causation. So part of the SDA piece, the picture has to be the cyber component of that. And I think that also the SDA piece, what, what we can do is, is if not prevent war altogether, at least do deconfliction. With proper SDA, you can go from weapons free to weapons, hold the weapons tight in a, in a combat situation if we know what the adversary is you know, with, with a lot of confidence. So that's all I have to say about that for right now. I'm, I'm looking forward to the panel. I really appreciate the opportunity to come out here and, and visit with everyone. And uh, I, I strongly believe that preventing space war is absolutely vital. I think this is the right form to do it international, multidimensional, legal. And it's the first form I've seen where we have a nerd with the, the lawyer next door. We're trying to solve these problems you know, together and because they actually have to be, they have to be symbiotic. Okay, before, before we get started with the questions, so just a clarification on a couple of things that were mentioned. So the, the, for those of you in the room that, uh, that are not familiar with it, the acronym FFRDC is a federally funded research and development corporation, right? So think of IDA, there's a number of them in town, RAND. They're, they're, they're organizations that were stood up in the 50s under, the, under a contractual agreement from the US government to do work that was associated with the government, right? A UARC is an organization that is attached to a university that a particular service or a particular government agency is funding to do specific research in a particular area. So you can imagine a UARC that would be focused, for instance, on space development, some, something that we're talking about in here today. The, uh, the other point that Joe just mentioned about this common operational picture, so I want to link you back to what Charles said before about timing, right? Because in order to have a common operational picture of what's happening in space, it's important that you understand the latency with which that display is, uh, is being presented. And the latency and understanding the level of latency in, contributes to the credibility of that common operational picture and of its usefulness to the operators that are trying to, to gain some situational awareness from it. <clears throat> We've talked, Again, quickly this morning, you've heard it again about attribution, about attribution in space. And again, this is, uh, bears some resemblance to the, to the cyber domain, right? So every time there would be an attack against some part of the US infrastructure, whether it was government or not, the very first question that you would get out of the White House is who did it? And what's the level of confidence that we have that they did it, that you're pointing to them? And that gets into the very um, sensitive part of what the intelligence community does, which has to do with sources and methods, right? And that's what makes most intelligence things very classified. So there's always a balance in terms of attributing an attack by someone or attributing some behavior to a particular entity, especially if it's another state entity. In, in the world of space, though, and General Burt mentioned this this morning a couple of times, it's important that we consider that we keep that in mind as we try to deal with the kinds of uh, operational challenges we have in space. The, uh, the comment that Chris made about the domains, so that the big difference here is that in and people are making this collaboration without truly understanding it, this correlation, cyber is a man-made domain. Right? We, we created that. 
we didn't create the space domain. We live with that. Like we live with the, the, the sea, like we live with the air. The, but the important thing to at least in my experience, was understanding what that domain meant in terms of the laws. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> another conversation, another life, <clears throat> we were talking with some people down on Pennsylvania Avenue about doing something against a particular country. And we had a map <clears throat> and we were all discussing it. And someone in the room said, well, you can't do that because here's where we are physically and here's where country X is over here. And if we did that, it means we would violate the sovereignty of the country that's between the two of them. And, and at first I was kind of stunned and I said, well, okay, but let's talk about how the internet works. <laughs> And, and let's talk about that, that little guy that's in that server that's moving these packets around, trying to find the quickest way to get from point A to point B. So again, the point of that was the, the technical understanding of the domain initially when we created Cyber Command was just not resident across the board. It is now, but this is 10 years later. And I think that, that perhaps one of the things we can consider in the space domain is, are we in that same place? And again, back to what General Burt said at the end, it's important that we understand that we help people that are not space technicians, if you will, or space, uh, they're not immersed in it, to help them understand what this means. Um, I cannot tell you how many times, again, in the world of cyber, we would have one of two kinds of meetings in the Pentagon. We'd either have a meeting where somebody would start talking technically and everyone would sit there and nod their heads knowingly and have absolutely no idea what the hell they were talking about, nobody. And there would be two full on geeks in the room and they'd be talking to each other and everybody else would sit there and I thought, this is nuts. Or the other, the other meeting was completely devoid of any technical knowledge and it was like a grad school seminar in policy. So <laughs> what we need to do is to, to find a way to bridge that. And so that's a, that, that's a good point that Chris made and we, we probably should, should dig into that. One last thing that I would mention and then we'll start to talk about this. General Burt this morning mentioned the expression space superiority. And she said, and she said, it's kind of like, you know, in other domains, we've had air superiority. So I would be interested in what the collective wisdom, what we think about, what does that mean? Air superiority is a local thing and it's time wise. And Charles is shaking his head. I'm sure you've been in these conversations. It's a difference from supremacy, right? So we've effectively, we, the US have had air supremacy for years. You can use the puck as mics, as handhelds. Pick them up. Oh, okay. How does this work? All right. So now I get to talk into the puck. Can you hear it? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> okay. So again, just to think about what it means for us to have space superiority what, what exactly does that mean is it is it confined to a particular time frame is it confined to a particular orbit and what does it mean we all kind of think we know what it means in the world of air superiority but maybe not so much in space so having said all that and now talking into a hockey puck which i must admit feels a little more awkward than talking into a microphone but none, nonetheless i think that's that's uh, the, the the purpose of all this so with that, I would uh, encourage your questions. I would throw it open for questions. If there aren't any right away, I'm gonna turn to the panelists and ask them to comment on what I've just said. Oh my God, okay. Just to show you that I really do like lawyers. Go ahead, <laughs> Okay, You can see this is gonna be a bit of a theme, right? Just to remind you, there's a lot of law coming up after lunch. So um, <laughs> I just wanna to add to your question. I love that question. And I'd really like to hear what the panel has to think about expressions like ultimate high ground, right? What, what does that mean? And is that a useful expression or not? So that's that's what I'm gonna throw in there. Gentlemen, that you, now that we all know how to operate these things, you press it to the green button, it's marine, <laughs> marine proof. You just hit the green button and talk. Yeah, we get to it. So uh, 30 years, uh, 28 of those in the Air Force, 
uh, all doing space and then two years with the Space Force. Um, so I'm going to come from a slightly jaded perspective at my answer, and I hope uh, I have a job tomorrow. A and that is, we applied the term ultimate high ground to space in an attempt to carry forward the same sort of doctrinal view that air power had uh, to the domain of space uh, in a way to try to articulate to the air power advocates uh, and to the other services, something that they would understand the same way we can't always talk geek to everybody or, or so I think it, it, it was an attempt to do that. Um, certainly there are benefits from space uh, to surveil and <clears throat> Uh, I'm interested to maybe have a sidebar discussion with you. You said the 67 Outer Space Treaty was the first sort of uh, space norm. Uh, I, I tend to think that uh, in 1957, when Russia launched Sputnik uh, and we established that territorial boundaries don't extend infinitely into space, that was really kind of the first space norm. So um, the fact that you can now overfly at any point on the Earth uh, from space that provides a, a unique perspective. That's part of that ultimate high ground. But the analogy breaks down quickly after that. Um, I was in a discussion not too long ago when talking about cislunar, and they said, well, that's even higher ground. And I said, okay, you get to a point where you're so far away from the fight that it really doesn't matter too much. Um, and and I, I believe that cislunar is very important to military space. It's important to protect national interests in space. But if we think that cis lunar is gonna help us directly impact a terrestrial conflict, I think we're deluding ourselves. It will be absolutely critical in future conflicts in space and monitoring the activities in space. So I, I think the, the term comes from uh, uh, the overbearance of uh, air power advocates to, to the space domain, and it quickly breaks down uh, in modern life. I mean, I'll offer some perspectives. So I, went to a university, I went to Leiden University for my master's in air and space law. So we taught air law and then space law. And when you think about um, aviation and you think about rights in public international air law, the Chicago Convention, states are absolutely sovereign over their national airspace. And you have to negotiate. And, and if you don't negotiate to enter into their airspace or land in their airspace or take off from their airspace, pick up passengers, drop off passengers, um, all of those things, they're absolutely sovereign over, and you, and you cannot do that unless you have permission, because states are absolutely sovereign over their national airspace. The situation is absolutely the reverse when we go to outer space. So we can talk about sovereignty in, uh, in our national borders, but once we get to outer space or when we get to international airspaces, sovereignty does not exist in space. Only an element, a component of sovereignty is, exists in outer space, and that's jurisdiction and control. Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty, we have jurisdiction over our national space objects and personnel thereof, and that's it. So um, that's why space is a shared domain, because it is not a place where states can extend their sovereignty, and by, via Article 2, national appropriation is prohibited into the space domain. So this is why that idea that phrase of dominance in outer space or space superiority, legally imp uh, illogical, impermissible under the Outer Space Treaty and under international law. Um, and I understand it's not a legal phrase when it is used, it's used in the phrase of you know, national security. Um, but how would, if state A says that we wanna be dominant and be superior in this shared space, oh, there's a local park, there's a, that all the neighborhood goes to, but I'm going to dominate that local park. How is that perceived by other actors? State A says it, state B hears it. They want to be dominant. They want to, you know, uh, be superior in this space, in this, in this shared domain. Um, it builds into escalation or at least anxieties, tensions, misperceptions. Um, and it, it, it is akin to, I would say, I don't want to be too provocative, but it is akin to saber rattling and saying, and, and, and when we talk about, and we haven't touched on the concept of inevitability, inevitability of conflict. But if you, if you make statements that you believe conflict in space is inevitable, I believe that makes conflict more inevitable. It makes it more likely to happen. I don't think conflict in space is inevitable, but the more people who do believe it and plan to do it and say, I don't want to win a war, in, or I don't want to start a war in space, but I, I intend to win one if one breaks out, that, that has the effect, I believe, of making conflict more likely. I'll leave it at that. 
No. Well, so that's a short answer. I don't think the ultimate high ground is really a useful motto. The reason is it, it implies that space is more important than the other domains. Sure. Oh, am I over here? I did this my cell phone too. There we go. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> so I think that it, the, the ultimate high ground implies that space is more important than the rest of the domains. It actually space has more importance and, uh, and value when it's integrated within the other domains. So I'd say it doesn't necessarily have good value. So if I could circle back uh, yeah, on, on Chris's ahead. comments. Um, so I, I think in space, uh, space superiority means the ability to do two things. One, have freedom of action to do what you want to do when you want to do it. We have that today, right? If, if we're not being interfered with by China or Russia, we can do what we want in space today. The other side of it, though, is the ability to deny the adversary to get that same benefit, to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And I think this is an important fact. Uh, it, is, it is localized. It is not uh, permissive throughout the entire domain all the time. So I, I agree with you that terms like space dominance are unnecessarily um, bellicose. There's a good word for you, huh? Sure. Yeah. Um, but I think the ability to deny uh, a potential adversary their use of space in a warfighting scenario is important because it's not about the assets in space. It's about the men and women on the ground that those assets protect. So if, uh, if we're having the fleet go over to support a, an activity in, in Asia and China is, is bent on denying that ship access to that AOR area of operation, they could use space assets to target um, those, those men and women on that ship. Um, and in order to protect them, we may need to deny China, for example, access to that ISR information or the command signal to, the, to their uh, shooters to, to take action. I think that is completely justified. Uh, I think it is a, a legitimate action. Um, and I think if we look at space superiority in terms of those isolated activities, I think it makes sense. But if we try to apply it to the same way that we had air superiority or air supremacy over Iraq and Desert Storm, that, that is, is not applicable. So. To, anybody else in this room remember who Maxwell Smart was? Am I the only one? Okay, but I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm talking into my shoe here. You know, it's, you know, it's this funky thing here. Obviously, the School of Design at ASU had nothing to do with designing this hockey puck here. The um, so the question that comes up based on what Charles just said, and I'd be interested in 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 you all responding to this. If we are going to deny someone else the use of a particular orbit or in space and we decide to take action how much of a consideration is the debris field that we are going to create play into the decision process you know in the in the kinetic world on here on earth eh, it's a little bit but not so much some in the missile defense area you don't want to explode missiles right over your homeland unless of course like the ukrainians you have to but nonetheless, is, is how much of that plays into the into the, the, the process by which we kind of uh, understand or think about the options? And, and one last thing, Charles, so the, 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 the piece about the, the um, that I mentioned before about the, the uh, sovereignty piece with cyber with regard to that, the other point that I was trying to, to tease out is that people are going to use what they interpret today to be their legacy view of space. And they're going to apply laws. They're going to apply policies that might not be so relevant and so and applicable to that domain, but they're going to do it anyway, which is kind of why, you know, forums like this and we have to help them understand that, uh, in the case that Chris brought up before about sovereignty, this isn't like airspace. This is something different, and trying to in and trying to incorporate legacy legal opinions. I'm not a lawyer, so it's probably the wrong terminology. Is generally not helpful in moving the conversation forward. This particular discussion I talked about, we went down a rabbit hole for 40 minutes about how the internet worked, and we never got to. <laughs> Never got to a goddamn decision about what we ought to do about this problem. So, uh, any rate. So, uh, I want to maybe reshape your question a little bit uh, because I, I don't think we necessarily want to deny an entire orbital regime 
from an adversary's use. Um, I also don't believe that uh, debris generating uh, effects are the only way that we can deny an adversary use of their activities. So um, there are a, a host of um, radio frequency, uh, temporary, uh, reversible uh, actions that can be taken against not just the satellite itself, but the entire uh, network. So the satellite has to transmit its data, uh, its information to some ground user. That happens through the RF spectrum. Um, so you can do jamming. Um, you can temporarily blind sensors. Uh, China's done that to us. Um, you can uh, do other actions to, again, temporarily deny uh, the adversary from, from using those capabilities. So it, it doesn't have to be an entire orbital regime, and it doesn't have to be debris generating. Um, and I think we need to start exploring the technologies and the policies, because they have to be working in tandem, um, that enable us to have options in the future. Uh, because if we don't have options in the future, all we're going to be able to do is take the actions that we've, we've had in the past. And too often that is a kinetic strike um, and potentially uh, terrestrially. Uh, General Burt talked about, we will respond in the time and place of our choosing and it doesn't have to be in space. I always wince a little bit uh, at comments like that because what is the uh, reciprocal nature between a satellite and a ground target? Um, you're not gonna say that those five tanks because they cost roughly the same amount as that one satellite is, is a good target. Um, that, that's not fair. So I, I think we have to look at, at those sorts of ramifications as well. And I think, you know, from a legal perspective, that that's a, a much bigger concern. Um, thank you for pointing that out that, you know, okay, they've hit, they've, that's one tank, that's another tank. Well, five tanks that allows us to hit a satellite. The idea of, and remember, we're still bound by those principles of necessity, distinction, proportionality. How, how, how can you go through that computation of what is proportionate? And can you, you know, rack these things up and say that this happened a couple of weeks ago at some point in time can you make a actual uh you know proportionate response which is distant in time um so that proportionality and also i would say the necessity you know this happened four weeks ago but we still meet the requirement of, of necessity so thank you for pointing that out very briefly on the topic of intentional creation of debris um and and i'll just i'll just say that i've written an article on um, you know, intentional creation of debris and its illegality, both under international space law and, and also under uh, law of armed conflict. First, under international space law, I went through those elements of the Outer Space Treaty, Article 9, set of, uh, of uh, you know, mutual assistance, cooperation, due regard, and prohibition on harmful contamination, and the positive obligation to take appropriate measures to prevent harmful contamination. Those are the space law elements. Think about this in the context of debris creation, but also in law of armed conflict, uh, indiscriminate weapons, indiscriminate effects of weapons are prohibited. So if you have weapons and weapon systems which cause indiscriminate effects, uh, which are long lived or you know um, <coughs> disproportionate, that is a violation of international humanitarian law, Geneva Conventions. Article 36 weapons reviews are required to look at weapon systems and see what are the effects of that. So you may be able to destroy things on earth, but when you destroy things in space, if you create long lived debris, which stretches out, which is encompasses the earth, you can't predict who's gonna be flying through that debris cloud into the future, including non-combatants and, and non-permissible targets. So consequently, it's pretty clear to me that if you add up those vague obligations of space law, but and additionally vague obligations that are binding from law of armed conflict, the creation of debris does not seem to be uh, meet those elements of distinction and proportionality. And I'll leave it at that. So if I could, Joe, can you uh, give us your thoughts on the following? We've been talking a bit about um, potential effects in space, right? So. Can, can you just give us some perspective on the reversibility of or irreversibility of cyber effects in space? And while you're doing that, there's a question that occurs to me personally, just having lived in this ecosystem, who's gonna own that? Is Cybercom or the Space Force? Who, as we see the domain of space and we see these cyber effects that are occurring in space, uh, how do you think that we ought to sort of parse those things out to a responsible command. 
Well, as far as who's in charge, that's above my pay grade. Uh, I imagine that they're both interacting, particularly one being in charge of space assets, the other worried about the ground infrastructure, Cyber Command being worried about infrastructure outside of space. I, I think they would be a dual. I don't know exactly who would be in charge. Uh, as far as reversibility, irreversibility, cyber does have irreversible consequences too. And uh, a, a, an adversary taking over a satellite can propel that satellite to another satellite and create the same sort of conflict we're having here. And so attribution in the cyber domain is so critical for us to understand uh, the, the intentions. Um, so as far as reversibility is concerned, uh, there's the electronic warfare, you know, CEMA is cyber electromagnetic activities. So we kind of branched all together and those are all part and parcel of the, of the, you know, uh, electronic warfare is similar to cyber. And now that is not really as, as fine a, um, a differential now. I think that for the reverse the irreversibility, what I'd like to do is, is talk about the nuclear option in similar to how you have a nuclear weapon go off and there's radiation all over, uh, maybe, Right for uh, for years and years, look at Chernobyl and how we'd had to go ahead and uh, how that could have been bad for Western Europe. Similar is for um, in space. So if we have a debris field that's going on for years and years and years, I think the best way to look at this doctrine is probably the nuclear doctrine as a, a piece to to uh, start from. And do we really have an an avenue to put that genie back in the bottle? Some of us talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and if, if we didn't have that go off or that nuclear weapons, can we go ahead and bring that back? Now we have a proliferation problem and so on. So we can spin our heads on that for a while. But I think that the nuclear doctrine might be the, the place to kick that off. I guess so across the board, um, we've we've kind of talked about like the cybersecurity threats of, of um, you know, where that data is coming from. And then also like just kind of understanding who who governs what and, and all those things in, in the spirit of, of both those themes. Uh, what's the best like the best situation for for SDA data like um, hosting? So would it be best to have that hosted by the government where you can kind of ensure security of, of that data or you know, having access to the public where you really don't know who it's gonna get sold to? That's a great question. Uh, there's multiple, uh, multiple equities here to, to look at. There's the, the immediate need for space domain awareness in terms of protecting assets and doing attribution, which is one side of it. As an industry person, I need data to do algorithm development. So one of the pro problems that we have right now, which is on both domains, is that the data is over -mentalized. There's too many saps and caveats that protect data. So it's difficult to get to a common ground. It's difficult to have someone read into a the same workstation to do that kind of work. And I, I think that that's something that the government needs to do is to start stepping back from those caveats and making sure that we can share data, even with our, our, our allies and other partners and in industry, so uh, we can make good use of it. Uh, I don't, I'm not really, I know that that, that's, that conversation has had uh, recently. I'm not so sure about what actions have been taken by the government in that regard. But I can say that with my own company, we've had a serious struggle with a caveat. Went from uh, Department of Defense, we had data that was taken from the Department of Defense, our own satellite, with a caveat that the DOD had, transferred to DHS in order to get it into our possession. That DOD caveat then became a Department of Energy caveat. So I had three departments working on this. In the end of the day, the DHS said, nope, we're out of here. And they just destroyed the data altogether. So we have to kind of overcome those bureaucracies. I, I think there's a kind of a two-edged sword when dealing with space domain awareness data. Um, and I'll start with, as General Burt said, we're trying to migrate the space traffic management role to the Department of Commerce. And I think if we're able to do that successfully, there's gonna be a level of transparency regarding where objects are, uh, what trajectory they're on, that, that will help us all, and by that I mean every spacefaring nation, uh, operate in a more safe and responsible manner. As we increase the transparency of that data, we also have to make sure that it is assured um, in the sense that someone can't get in there and tamper with it. Because if uh, a country could do a cyber attack and, and alter the two line element sets or where they think objects are, that could potentially be catastrophic. Imagine someone breaking into the FAA's uh, you know, ground sensors and, and changing the locations of aircraft, right? So we have to be able to make sure that we can protect uh, the data that we're making more transparent. Um, Joe talked about some of the classification issues. 
as a warfighting domain, uh, like air, land, sea, uh, there will be certain military activities that will need to be kept classified to protect uh, our limitations and capabilities and protect the, the men and women that, are, that rely on those systems. So uh, while we need to have greater transparency to maintain space traffic management, there's always gonna be something that we're going to hold back uh, in order to protect lives ultimately, so. Um, you know, I, I've written a moot court problem a couple of years ago, and I'm thinking of how what a what a scenario that we that conceptualizes this. Let's say uh, spacecraft from State A and spacecraft from State B are on a collision course, and the owners of space spacecraft A um, have the data, have the awareness, and know that they need to perform maneuvers to get out of the way, and they communicate that to State B. And state P doesn't trust them, or or wants to verify verify them verify for themselves, um, and a collision does happen. Uh, if, if, if we're in a circumstance where only one actor is the owner and the purveyor of the information, all these issues of trust, of you know motives, incentives, um, reliability are implicated, and and that's not. Uh, optimal compared to a situation where we have transparency, where you don't, where you can see for yourself. You know, there's a reason why we have uh, body cam uh, cameras on cops, why we have dash cams, why we have open hearings and we have an open society. So you don't have to trust and you don't have to rely on hearsay. You can verify it for yourself. So that that notion that if you say that a collision is going to happen, people you know, other actors may view your statement cynically and say, well, I don't know if we really trust them. Uh, they just want us to get out of the way. If, you, if you're in a situation where you can verify it for yourself or everyone knows, everyone can see for themselves, that's, it. that's gonna be a better situation, especially when we get into the context of assigning, of, of attribution, of assigning blame, of assigning liability and negligence, uh, is if, you know, we can see for ourselves what happened and have some, a whole lot more trust in it than just relying on what someone said. One more comment, if I can. You know, wars are often fought and started by a, uh, a lack of understanding of adversary intentions. And so the, the penultimate part of SDA is to make sure we understand the intentions, strategic and operational, mm -hmm. for adversaries. Um, thank you for the panel. So I had actually two questions. One is that when we use a word like space domain awareness, has it evolved since the Gulf War, right? So before 1991, the understanding of the space domain was different and most of the regulations were formed during that time. And today, uh, I do know that since 1991, space is also seen as a military domain and not just as a park, as Chris was mentioning. So the implications of that, what it means. And then the second question I have is, there is a lot of, when I talk to the strategic community, there is, the, um, there is actually confusion when you talk about concepts like shared space, because we do know the Outer Space Treaty calls space a province of mankind, but the United States does not treat uh, space as a global common. So that contradiction, uh, I would be very interested to hear your views. Thank you. I mean, those that kicks off a whole a whole host of very interesting questions. You're right to say that the Outer Space Treaty says that the exploration and use of outer space, the activity of exploring outer space, is the province of all humankind. So that's a you know um, aspirational language, but it says that no state can restrict another state um, from you know you don't have to ask the UN or NASA or the United States to put your space object uh, into outer space. Um, you know, in terms of Domains, though, this is an interesting thing. You know, um, I'll just say this isn't really a security com um, comment, but talk to space scientists, pe people who are using space for peaceful purposes, talk to the astronomers. Space for them is a scientific domain, it's a domain of exploration, and that's how they primarily think about it. And then for, it's different again for folks who want to commercialize space. Space is an economic sphere, they see it as this is the place where we can do commerce, we can, we can innovate. Uh, and for the military, no, space is a military domain. And so we're all talking about the same space. Even if they're from the same country, we're talking about the same area. It's a commercial domain, a scientific domain, a military domain, a domain for national prestige and to you know uh, have soft extension of soft power. But we're all talking about the same space. In fact, it is 
uh, shared even by the same actors as, as it's conceptualized different. Yeah, agreed. Uh, and the same could be said about the maritime domain. It's a domain of scientific exploration, of commerce, of warfare. But the unique aspect is in land and air and maritime, you can cordon off boundaries and say, this area right now is being specially designated for the launch uh, or for a military drill or for a scientific exploration. You can't do that in space because we all share all of the domain all of the time. And so that's one of those areas where the analogy you know, begins to break down. We have to think of space as, yeah, there is a truly unique aspect of space as a domain. Um, your first question was on the evolving definition and understanding of space domain awareness. Um, a few years back, we used to call it space situational awareness. Um, and depending on who you talk to, that meant different things. Some people said, well, that's detect, track, identify, characterize an object, and, and it's what I am now transferring over to the Department of Commerce for space traffic management. Other people took a broader view of space situational awareness to include intelligence activities, not just in space, but on land and, and anywhere else, cyber that could impact or affect the space domain. Um, it also included things like space weather. Um, so when we talk about space domain awareness today, um, I view it as that broader set of what we call space situational awareness. So you need to understand what is going on in your environment. You need to understand what threats are posed to your capabilities. You need to understand what activities uh, are happening from a weather perspective or from a commercial or from a civil uh, activity that you might have to take into consideration as well. So it, it's a much broader set. Um, there's been a lot of great activity in the recent years by uh, the Space Force to deploy new sensors. Um, the Space uh, uh, Telescope that went, recently went to uh, Australia, uh, the development of the Space Fence, uh, DARK is coming online here hopefully pretty soon. Um, but I think those really do a good job of keeping up with the sheer congestion of space and really don't get to some of that additional level of, of understanding uh, that's truly required for space domain awareness um, that could protect our assets uh, or potentially hold other a a assets at risk. So I think there's even further work that can be done uh, to define space domain awareness going forward. So if I could, uh, this is the last, yeah, we got like two minutes here. One last question for the panel here. We, this morning, uh, the issue of how the FAA controls airspace came up. So what I'd like the panel to, to give us some perspective on is, A, do you ever see that feasibility in space where people have discrete squawks? Or in the case of operating in the area right around DC, we have what's called an ADSB. It's an airborne surveillance. It's the airplane is actually transmitting all the time its position to different people and that at it to different places, but to the same folks that are on the scopes to try to deconflict uh, airplanes that are flying around. Do you ever see that feasibility in space? And if so, back to the point that uh, uh, someone mentioned, it might have been Chris a minute ago, I took a note on this, about the credibility of the data that's coming through that it would seem to me that technically there might be a way that we could display the credibility of the data or could get people to agree on data protocols like we have for, I mean, when we fly into someone else's airspace, Russian airspace or anywhere, we are squawking assigned codes, et cetera, et cetera, so they can distinguish you know, friend from foe in the commercial sector. And we do in the military, obviously, as well. But uh, I would just be interested to, just to kind of wrap this up before lunch to get uh, each of you to give me your, or give us your perspective on that. Joe, we'll start with you down at the end. Uh, interesting question. I The short answer is yes, I think there is a, a way to do it. You have to use zero knowledge cryptography and uh, those techniques to make sure that any node in the architecture that might be compromised doesn't have the data necessary, because this is an operational security concern. Having a position anywhere gives a, a solution envelope, right, for an ASAT or, or other types of attacks. So we do have to be concerned about that. Definitely, there's a there's a way to do it. And uh, without getting into a lot of details, I think it's some, something that we've, uh, we've actually discussed previously. Um, so 
it, it's very important when you're in a, in a space battle to know who the adversaries are, who the hostile actors are quickly. And so like we talk about space weapons free, you are attacking any satellite that you're not positively identifying as friendly. And that could be a dangerous place for a friendly satellite to not identify itself, right? So we need to, and hopefully that conflict doesn't happen. Of course, we're, we're worrying about preventing a space war, but identifying each of these systems, we can know a glitch. We can know what happens with our own or in satellites. It helps uh, the, the IFF indicator gives us a good heart, heartbeat, right? So these are, these are all part and parcel of the operations of the constellation. So yeah, I do think it's, it's, not only feasible, but very useful. Um, well, I'll approach it from a different perspective, and I know time is short. So I'll briefly take you, let's go to the moon for a second. <laughs> I'll keep it short. Um, if, if we are operating, say, in a permanently shadowed region or a cold trap, and there's pristine scientific opportunities to do space science and learn about, you know, formation of the planets or, you know, deep space uh, observations. But at the same time, there's rare earth elements there and maybe water ice. Well, as I mentioned before, is it a commercial domain or is it a scientific domain? Right now, there is no hierarchy in international law or national law about who gets to go there first and who has priority. Um, and so that will have to be decided. So when we get to particular domains, that hierarchy of is it primarily military, primarily scientific, primarily commercial, that decision will have to happen. Likely it will happen first on a national level. Um, it is true historically that first actors get to set precedent, although that does not exist as a legal principle. Um, but, um, you know, the so there'll be some norms which develop on that, but very soon after it would be a international discussion about who takes priority and, and how we you know, govern uh, behaviors either on celestial bodies or back closer here on earth um, to, to, to get closer back on earth and, and get into the area of preventing conflict in space. Finders keepers is not a legal precedent. No. Okay, good. Um, so yes, uh, using uh, an IFF type signal on, on all satellites is technically possible. Uh, I think uh, the same way we do it for air traffic where, you know, uh, going into Iraq, uh, Desert Storm, I probably didn't have those uh, squawking signals going out for, for the Iraqis too, right? So there's probably going to be times when we will need to turn off the signals for, for some activities, but but absolutely, there, there is a way to do that um, effectively and safely. Uh, and then the, the assuredness, the, the military um, distinction uh, is going to be required as well. If, if, if we say this satellite is a military satellite, um, it, it better be. Uh, if we say it's a commercial satellite, it better be. And the same is true for all the countries that, that follow that sort of regime. So um, the, there's uh, technically, it's, I don't think it's a challenge. I think operationally and, and diplomatically, there's a couple hurdles to, to overcome. You know, one more comment, if I can, just, I wanna take this a little bit above the IFF uh, discussion here, is that in a, in a war, we may have to go to autonomous protection of our space assets. Mm -hmm. And that would imply that we're cut off from the ground and imply that we're cut off from most external sensing. So to have autonomous self-awareness is really, really important. And so there are ways in, of doing that, but we need to expand on that a little bit. Uh, the space to ground links are very vulnerable and the space, uh, the ground stations are very vulnerable to kinetic attacks and everything else. So being able to have that entire war picture, well, defense part, and to what, to what extent what playbooks can be allowed to, to be uh, put in there is, is a really critical piece. But it's all about, like I, I talk about the, the phenomenology algorithm, the modalities, we're talking about something else. This is a lack of external sensing. How do we go about finding who's who? Or, oh, we're eating, yes. <laughs> so we're going to break for lunch. We have a nice hour and a half. I hope you all do stick around for the afternoon program. We are recording also the session, so we'll be sharing all of this. But um, look forward to our second panel moderated by Melissa at 1 p.m. We'll, we'll resume. Bon appétit.
Testing one, two, three. Testing one. We'll go ahead and start taking our seats. Get going. Um, yeah, we got some right here. Touch the one, two, three. Great. All right. I'd like to invite everyone to regain your seats and to invite our second panel up to the front of the room. Where's Melissa? Yes, Matthew, come on up. <laughs> yes. You're here. Yeah. Melissa. No. We'll have to do a little tap dance to fill the time. There was like meant to be a big thing. Okay, we're good. All right. I do apologize because we have a speaker downstairs. So I think he's on a call. So, yes, it is Dan. No, we were hoping to just start a few minutes early. Um, so that was an executive decision. Well, in the meantime, I, I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation for Melissa DeSwart, um, who, yes, <laughs> came in all the way from Flinders <laughs> University. And um, as I shared earlier this morning, this project was conceived uh, about a year ago through one of our brainstorming sessions. And Melissa was a part of that uh, and continues to be very actively engaged with the Interplanetary Initiative and various of our research projects. So um, Melissa has been really shepherding this forward. And so I want to recognize that and thank you, Melissa. Yes. We no, we kicked it off a few minutes early, but we'll say if you want to maybe just set the table um, as we wait for Dan, just say a few words. You have that. You yeah, so you just have here. to turn it on and then. Maybe it's this way. All right, so <laughs> thanks, Jessica. Okay, so um, my name is Melissa Deswart. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a professor at Flinders University in Australia. So that's why I have a funny accent. So uh, forgive me for that and uh, start waving if I start talking too fast because that's what I've been told that Australians do. And of course we abbreviate every, every word. So the other thing I want to draw to your attention is we did bring some Tim Tams with us all the way from Australia. So for those of you who need a chocolate fix, either now or after this session, they have been hidden in the back corner up there and will be um, made available um, 
to you uh, if you eagerly participate uh, in the next session. So that's your, your incentive. Uh, so we, we are uh, lacking Dan. He will be here in a minute. So I do apologise for that. Um, I would like to um, thank everyone who is involved in this panel and I will introduce them to you. But to also put a bit of um, context around this, you know, we're, we're building up through the day. So um, we'll be drawing upon what was discussed in the last panel, as well as drawing on um, the comments that uh, were um, made by General Burt. Um, and there will, uh, Bob, be much discussion of law in this panel. Um, so I promised you that and uh, that's what we're going to deliver on. But in the same way as the other panel, this panel has been comprised of people from academia, industry uh, and also uh, defence. And I should say we also were going to be joined by uh, Chris Borgen, who has been unable um, to attend due to uh, COVID, which, you know, we've all very used to affecting us for the last few years. But um, we, we are very lucky to be joined by Matt King. So let me introduce you to, I will introduce you to all three panellists, even though Dan is not here yet. Um, so uh, we have Lieutenant Colonel Wolf, who's the Deputy Staff Judge Advocate at United States Space Command. And in this capacity, he advises US Spacecom Commander and Staff on law and policy matters affecting command mission. Um, he was commissioned as an infantry officer from the United States Military Academy in 2003 and graduated from William and Mary Law School in 2010 and became a judge advocate. He's had a large range of active assignments. Uh, and in addition to this, he has uh, served at the Judge Advocate General Centre and School in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, as Associate Professor of Administrative and Civil Law, and also he has served as Chief of National Security Law at US Spacecom. Uh, he holds Masters uh, in Law degrees from uh, in Military Law from the Judge Advocate General Centre and School, and also uh, in Space, Cyber and Telecommunications Law uh, from the University of Nebraska. So you can see why we're very lucky to have him on this panel. Um, Dan? <laughs> Dan Seppoli, who is CEO and co-founder of Leo Labs, uh, and he created Leo Labs to drive advances in space traffic safety, space situational awareness, and preservation of the space environment um, through providing actionable real-time information. So he's going to be the real technical expert in telling us exactly what it is that can be seen in the space domain. Um, prior to uh, setting up Leo Labs, he worked at SRI International as Program Director for Space Debris Tracking, uh, Deputy Director of the Oceans and Space System Centre, and Supervisor for the Allen Telescope Array, which was a, here he is, a radio astronomy facility. Um, Dan led numerous SSA research and development efforts aimed at developing technologies for tracking large constellations of low-cost satellites created in the space industry. And uh, I'm pleased to say he's also been a frequent visitor to Australia where Leo Labs has an amazing space radar now in Western Australia. Uh, and, and one thing I should also note about that is the significant effort that Leo Labs went to in um, developing a great relationship with a local uh, Indigenous community. So it's very important in Australia that there is a close relationship between the space industry and understanding of uh, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait communities. And so um, there was a uh, a strong representation of them, not only in the construction of the facility, but in the way the facility itself was commissioned. So I think something we've touched on again a couple of times today is who, who, who are the stakeholders in the space industry? Now, luckily here uh, on my left is Colonel Matthew T. King, Chief of International and Administrative Law, Officer of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And uh, he provides legal advice to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in his capacity as the principal military advisor to the president, the Secretary of Defence and the National Security Council. Colonel King also advises the Joint Staff Directorates and the combatant commands on international, operational, administrative and national security law issues. 
Um, Colonel King has previously served as staff judge advocate for the 30th Space Wing at Vandenberg, supporting space lift and Western Range operations. Uh, Air Staff Attorney advising senior leadership on operations and international law. Uh, Appellate Defence Counsel uh, representing clients before the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals, Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces and the United States uh, Supreme Court. Um, many, many other uh, active deployment roles here, but also just pointing out that he has been involved in teaching at the US Air Force Academy, Law of Armed Conflict, Advanced Law of Armed Conflict, International Law and Law for Air Force Officers, uh, as well as a range of other uh, really important important high profile um, deployments. So thank you all for joining me today for this discussion. We're very lucky. So um, we've heard a lot this morning. I, th I think General Burt did an amazing job of really uh, setting the scene and setting up what the really big questions are. Uh, and we heard the discussion um, that picked up on some of these threads in the last panel. Um, the sorts of things I think that I would like for us to flag in this panel are issues such as what does it really mean by due regard? So we're going to touch on some law from, from uh, uh, law of armed conflict, but also looking at uh, international space law. Uh, I think I'd like to ask some questions about, you know, how does international law promote shared values? So we talk about law, we talk about norms and we talk about values. How do they all kind of interact with one another? Um, I know we really want to talk about how close is too close because I think that's the question of the day. Um, and uh, I think I also really want to get Dan to tell us a lot more about, you know, what, what is it that we actually do know about what's going on? So, so we make assumptions about, you know, we, we know something but we don't know everything. How much is it that we, we actually do know? So I'm going to ask each of you the question about, you know, what is it at the moment that's keeping you awake at night? In this area, what, what is the, the, the key question that, you know, you think really um, needs to be, to be dealt with? So, Matt, can I start with you? Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, <laughs> So um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me, um, and and I'm sure there is disappointment that uh, Chris Borgen is not here, but I can uh, assure you I am the Chris Borgen of the Air Force. Uh, but uh, now, um, so you know, I, I think he would definitely bring an academic perspective, um, whereas I have inherently a military perspective. But I, I don't think that those are uh, mutually exclusive types of views. Um, you know, we heard earlier about all the different ways that space is being used, um, all the different contexts in, in which we, we look at these legal issues. And I, I do think you have to have a holistic view. I don't think you have to have just one. Um, but uh, with all that said, actually, I'm sorry, I have a preamble. I should note, um, I, and, and for Josh as well, um, we are here in our, certainly we are, we're officers in the military, but we are here in our personal capacities. So uh, the views that we express today are our own um, and not necessarily those of the Department of Defense um, or the U.S. government at large. So with that, uh, I apologize. I'll get back to it. Um, but, you know, the issue that I think, uh, um, I don't know if it keeps me up at night, but what I think is the most interesting is, you know, the, the question of what, not just what law applies, but how do we apply that law? Um, because I think space is, in addition to being the intersection of a number of different interests, it is the intersection of a number of different um, forms of law. And, you know, for the, for the lawyers in the room, you know, different types of lex specialis. You know, this, th there's an idea in the law that um, there can certainly be general notions of law. Um, that are that are applicable to most of the things that states or, or individual actors at times can do, but there are also areas of specialty in the law, um, and one of those is international space law that applies to the space domain and activities in space. Another one of those is the law of armed conflict, um, and that governs how states engage in, in armed conflict. Um, and then, you know, associated with that are things like, you know, the you said, the law of, of going to war and, and various other areas of law that are really specialized and they replace the general rules of international law. Um, and we don't entirely know how that, the, if there's a conflict, uh, how a conflict between um, these specialized areas of law will play out in outer space. Um, so I think to find that out, we can all have opinions 
but the only opinions that really matter are those of states who are practicing in this arena. So we, we certainly, you know, the U.S. government has views on what law applies, and we will, you know, in good faith apply the law to how we think space operations should be conducted, um, whether peacetime or, or in conflict. Those might be different than what other states view. And so the, the only way we can really get to a place where we know what the law really is, is after we have states either agreeing to it in a convention, um, you know, you can assess the, the prospects of that happening, um, or through uh, state practice, and it's consistent state practice informed by a sense of legal obligation. Those are the two places where international law comes from. And if we don't have treaties, we don't have conventions, the law is going to have to come from practice. So what I think is most interesting is just figuring out not just what we think as a United States government, but what other states think and what they do um, in this domain for how we apply rules. Um, you know, we can maybe get into it later, but, you know, how liability works, um, which space has a regime for that. But there's also some there's permissive things that you can do in, in an armed conflict. You know how astronauts are treated. Are they envoys of mankind or is a military astronaut just another military member? There's a lot of questions out there that I think are an, unanswered and will remain unanswered until states answer them. So that's what I'm looking at. Thank you. All right, Dan, over to you. Yes, well, good afternoon, everyone. And a big thank you to ASU and the organizers and Melissa for having me here today. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion and I uh, also really enjoyed uh, General Burt's uh, comments this morning. Uh, the, the major thing that uh, kind of drives me, that drives Leo Labs is scaling, that the space industry right now is going through an unprecedented rapid growth. Uh, the number of satellites that were in low Earth orbit in 2019 was about 800. Uh, today, there are close to 7,000 satellites operating in low Earth orbit. We'll hit the 10,000 satellite mark uh, later this year. So in about five years, the number of active satellites has grown tenfold. Uh, on top of that, the number of launches is increased quite dramatically. The number of satellites on each launch uh, is going up, and the satellites are becoming more nimble. So kind of the thing that keeps me up at night is, is somebody going to be surprised? And does that surprise lead to some lead to a conflict, lead to some negative consequences? And just with the sheer amount of new activity in space, uh, the opportunity for surprise is growing. Um, one of the things that was one of the kind of interesting and alarming things that happened within about the last eight months is there was a dead Russian satellite that came alive. It had been dead about six years, came back alive, executed a massive maneuver and pulled over next to some other Russian satellites. And they proceeded to practice proximity operations uh, around that satellite. That, uh, well, you know, there's 13,000 pieces of debris in low Earth orbit right now. You know, 7,000 useful satellites, 13,000 pieces of debris. So kind of what else is out there that uh, potentially uh, would wake back up? Um, we've also seen uh, a lot more um, commercial proximity operations. We've seen debris removal missions. Uh, we've seen satellite servicing missions. And I think these are a part of a, a healthy uh, space economy in the future, but they can also look threatening. So there is a need for better communication, better co uh, cooperation uh, across the industry so that we don't inadvertently surprise somebody. So those are the, some of the activities running through my head, but I do think it's a very exciting time to be in the space industry. Thanks, Dan. Okay, Josh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. And thanks also to Arizona State University for hosting this and, and uh, allowing me to be a part of it. It's, uh, it's quite an impressive uh, event here. So thank you. And also thanks, Colonel King, for doing the disclaimer so I don't have to, uh, <laughs> to tread that ground again. Um, as far as interesting questions, I think one that, that I think about a lot and came up some this morning, both in some of the questions uh, to General Burton, some of the things that she said is about and builds on what Dan was talking about, this concern of surprise. And, and when I think about it, I think of this, um, what, what might be available in the current international space law uh, context to do something about that. And so one of the models that people discuss sometimes are this idea of zones, right? A keep out zone or a safety zone, some sort of barrier. And General Burt, um, elaborated on that a little bit saying, well, you know, that, that might be nice, but it would, it's obviously going to vary on whether you're talking about what orbital regime, 
um, and, and what uh, activities are being conducted there. Um, so putting aside that there's some practical matters to, to work out, uh, the, the, the basis or, or usefulness of that still could be there, right? Uh, given the sh shortcomings of space domain awareness, so we talked about there's that latency and, and also just some of the incomplete stuff there. There's a challenge, and General Bird mentioned this, to discern intent, to understand why uh, this Russian satellite has plane matched a US satellite in, in low Earth orbit, or what these, what a uh, Chinese satellite that's capable of, of uh, moving something into a graveyard orbit, what, what intent does it have if it moves somewhere else along the geo belt near other, um, other important satellites? And so that's where you could see some of the utility of these zones. But as we heard from the last panel, there are some limitations on what states can do and prescribe in, in outer space. And, and the short answer is they can do and prescribe very little for, uh, for uh, binding rules on anyone else. There's this freedom of use principle, kind of the first principle of the outer space treaty, uh, further limited by a prohibition on national appropriation or claim of sovereignty over outer space or, or any of the uh, celestial bodies. <clears throat> but we also do have this, uh, do regard and this prohibition on or some obligations related to activities that could cause potentially harmful interference. That's in Article Nine of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which we heard about some on the last um, last panel. So, is there room, and to what extent could there be room in those tools, leaning hard on Article Nine and do regard uh, to to perhaps make some progress, maybe initially as a non-binding measure, perhaps progressing further. I don't know, but it's a but it's a very interesting uh, question to explore with potentially a lot of utility. I think the one big piece here that I always interests me about international space law, and General Burt mentioned something along this fact that space was kind of built backwards. You know, legally it's a similar similar matter where we have sort of this set of rules that predates the majority of the activity in the domain. In the maritime domain, you have centuries of activity that sort of predate UNCLOS and the understanding of custom that developed into more of a treaty-based system, but space is kind of inverted. And so what does that mean? Well, when we have these vague terms in the treaty, we try to understand, well, what is the scope of this due regard obligation? What is when does What constitutes harmful interference that would require some sort of consultation? Well, it means what states say it means, like Colonel King had mentioned. So what is a state practice? And the interesting piece as we see activity increase in the space domain, what I'm always looking for is what are the official statements and responses from any other state? And particularly, do they describe it as irresponsible or unlawful? And today it's almost always the, the former and not the latter, which to me creates a very expansive view of, or a very permissive view of what uh, is permitted in other international space law. So I'll conclude there, Melissa, maybe we can go to some questions. Thank you. That's great. And and uh, I I love the fact that, you know, Article 9 is what keeps you awake at night. You know, I love that, that lawyers like, Article 9, it's Article 9, it's coming to get me. You know, I think Chris can probably relate to that as well. So, but I think so many concepts in there, you know, that that we, we, we have to keep unpacking. So, like, who is doing what in space? and where you know that's what it comes down to and you know we touched a little bit on the on the you know the um, national activities in space so we know that states are responsible for the national activities but we haven't even got to the point now where, we, where we're saying well what are national activities what do we do when you have states that um, don't don't regulate what activities are within their domain or even ones that do but you have actors that are acting outside of what what is permitted so again you know i think it's important to remember that the space law regime was created around an expectation that it was only states who were going to be doing things in space and now with the question of you know attribution and what is going on up there we've got a whole bunch of of actors that are not not states that are other actors who can become engaged in things and again we talked about dual use so i'm sure that the audience has some burning questions i can already see hands are up so we'll get that mic roving and we'll we'll get the discussion going Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, Bruno de Souza. I'm temporarily visiting scholar at GW, but I'm a professor of law in Portugal. So thank you for your remarks. Um, I'm going to the law of armed conflict. And uh, what we've learned from the war in Ukraine is that the concept of neutrality 
is uh, up for discussion. NATO has a point of view of what neutrality means. NATO is neutral to the conflict, for example, just one quick example. But I would like to uh, expand that, uh, hear, your, hear your thoughts on what is neutrality these days when the private sector is also part of the, of the asset of an operation, military operations. Thank you very much. All right, I'll go first. I suspect there are lots of opinions. Um, you know, fundamentally, the answer is um, I'm not entirely sure. I, um, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I don't know if Melissa mentioned it or not, but, uh, you know, we're, we're part of a, a, a space manual project, uh, a different one um, than was mentioned before. But it, we, we would have discussions about neutrality, and this was before the Ukrainian conflict, and I think there's a lot of debate about where the law of neutrality stands um, internationally, um, just after, you know, in, in, in the age of the UN system, you know, after, after the Second World War and kind of in the system we have right now. Um, but I, I think it goes to, a, and I should say, just the, the reactions by the world community uh, in response to the, the aggressive Russian war in, in the Ukraine has demonstrated that, um, you know, maybe some of our, we, we need to rethink about how we assess where neutrality stands nowadays. Personally, I believe that there is a, a law of neutrality that exists. Um, what's really interesting about neutrality is that so much of it um, comes from treaty, but it's treaties from 1907, um, and it was about neutrality on land and neutrality at, you know, on the sea or, at, you know, in ports and at sea. And so while there are some parts of that law of neutrality that is still in the books, and it would at least arguably apply to space. Um, you know, in, in the law of neutrality, they talk about, um, you know, telegraph communications, um, you know, things like that. And I think you can make a, a pretty good argument that those things can be extrapolated into some, some communications and signals. Um, it's not really talking about, that, that's what happens on the land domain or, or potentially in the sea domain. For what is purely in the space domain, I don't know that the treaties necessarily get you there. But if you peel back where the treaties came from and you look at the state practice over generations, um, there are some core essential aspects of the law of neutrality, such as a duty of impartiality on, on, the, uh, on the part of neutral nations um, and a duty to essentially leave other states out of it on, on, the, on the, uh, the part of the belligerents. And I think that essence can be extrapolated into space. If you wanna make the argument either through, you know, Article Three of the Outer Space Treaty, which incorporates general international law into space, or just from, um, you know, kind of as General Burt said, hey, you know, this is how we apply the law. This is how it happens. And, and a lot of international law is really about how the law governs what states do, irrespective of, of what domain we're talking about. So. I think that um, this is not a tight answer to your <laughs> your question, but I think there there is a law of neutrality. I think it does apply to space, but it goes back to kind of my opening comments. I think we still have to see how how that works. Um, one note I will make is you know Article Six um, of the Outer Space Treaty. It, as Melissa said, it does assign responsibility for national space activities to to a state. Um, I. And I have heard arguments that, um, well, if you are responsible for the actions of all your nationals in space, that means that in a neutrality context, um, that's, you know, it's almost tantamount to the state doing those activities. So if, if a private actor in space is acting in a non-neutral way, that can be imputed to the state. I, I don't subscribe to that view. Um, certainly the state may be responsible for them. What responsibility means though, I don't think automatically means a state is being dragged into an armed conflict that it does not intend to be a part of. Um, that would be a, a perverse outcome. Um, and I think that'd be inconsistent, you know, in legal terms, that'd be inconsistent with the, the object and purpose of the Outer Space Treaty and frankly, the law of neutrality. Um, so I, I would disagree with any assertions um, of that, but, but it does raise some very interesting questions about how these particular space provisions do apply um, in, in that context. And I would just add on, you know, a, a another difficult component of this 
is, well, to who, let's say neutrality does apply and that that's not a difficult question, but to whom does it apply? To which state? Is it the state that's exercising uh, supervision and control under Article 6? Is it a state where a ground station is located, a TTNC station? Is it, you know, you could have different needs for different types of space enabling uh, services that are provided. So uh, it gets very difficult to, to unwind quickly. Another point I think is worth raising here, the challenge of uh, trying to draw, we talked about this earlier, of uh, analogizing to other domains. Like Colonel King said, the, what we do have on the books, so to speak, there's a black letter law, actually agreed conventions on neutrality are quite old and they're very specific to land and maritime domains. And so while there, you could discern some kind of rules of general applicability from there, they are how how far you can analogize that without getting straying from the actual object and purpose is pretty difficult to understand. So a, a sticky question for sure on on neutrality. Um, not as a lawyer, but uh, I can take this from more the uh, the engineering and business leader perspective. Uh, I think a lot of the change we're seeing in the space industry is companies carving out uh, new commercial areas in uh, domains that were primarily military in the past, uh, specifically for Leo Labs. Uh, space tracking, space traffic management, space domain awareness was entirely a military activity until very recently because it was the U.S. Air Force, now the U.S. Space Force, who had the radars, had the telescopes. These were very expensive installations. They were the only ones with the capability, so they just kind of did it. Uh, what we're now seeing, uh, you know, what uh, Leo Labs and others are driving is essentially a commercial map, call it like the Google Maps, uh, for space. So now a commercial provider uh, putting out there a common platform that others can build on that essentially where are the roads, where's the traffic, you know, annotate other information on the map. And the goal is to build up the entire space industry around it. So commercial satellite operators can use it. It can be used for space flight tours or, you know, tourism in space in the future. Uh, it can be used for scientific satellite missions, um, but also military missions as well. And I think we kind of saw some of this uh, maybe many years ago um, with the paper maps. You know, it used to be that like the U.S. Army would make its own maps and, you know, or a military would make its own maps. Um, nowadays, the commercial sector often has the best mapping data. So you start there and put your own special layer on top. I expect, you know, we'll see that kind of in the space industry as well. So change, changing boundaries. Well, I have a question about non-binding versus binding. Uh, you know, if, if we were to see an actor in the space domain, an unfriendly actor doing something which is unwanted, maybe unsustainable and troublesome, um, what can we respond with? You, you know, you're violating a non-binding, subjectively determined rule of the road or standard. And I say that to, to say this, um, our non-binding approaches to international law sufficient to prevent conflict in space? I could, I could start on that. And I, I think um, even some would argue that even binding rules like the UN Charter have their limitations on preventing armed conflict. So I think uh, to the notion that any, any agreement or uh, accord, whether it's non-binding or binding in and of itself, obviously there, it, it has its limitations. What I, and I'm certainly not a, personally a huge advocate of the, of non-binding measures because they, they have the, they have even more limitations, I think, obviously than binding. Uh, having said that, there is some utility, I think, in the international community for using those as sort of a stepping stone. There's sort of an initial step along a path towards gaining more consensus and more comfort over what might be a more limited scope, but perhaps a later, a binding instrument. I think that's to me kind of the principal utility of something such as a non-binding measure, whereas it's a little bit easier, less skin in the game, so to speak, for someone to uh, sign up for it and or it gives some experimentation ground for people to run with that for a while and then understand, OK, well, what are the what are the benefits of this and maybe sell that to to others to try to gain more consensus? You know, a, a current example in this uh, would be like the. Secretary of Defense published some tenets of responsible behavior in space a couple of years ago. More recently, uh, the department has 
has um, advocated some specific behaviors nested under those specific under those tenets of responsible behavior. And again, General Burt mentioned them. That none of them are very specific. Uh, some of them even just mirror language from the Outer Space Treaty, which at least for all the state parties, the Outer Space Treaty, they're legally obligated to do. Um, but I think the concept there is to generate an effort towards studying and, and trying to put perhaps some more meat on the bone, so to speak, of some of these vague terms and develop some more shared understanding. And then that potentially being a stepping stone towards either perhaps a binding instrument or at least something to say, uh, you know, all of these states agree that that's irresponsible behavior, but now, you know, some make a pariah, so to speak, out of the states that, that uh, violate those. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think I agree with a lot of what Josh was saying there. And I'll just kind of two, two areas or two, two, two points. Um, I think you have to consider the, um, the obligations and rights separately from remedies. And, and I think if you kind of separate those things, um, you know, there, there could say there's, you know, a, a clear convention that everybody signs on to that you will not do X, Y, Z. Um, that's not going to stop them from doing that unless there is a, a remedy that will actually um, cause them to not do it. Um, I, I should say, if if every state um, could be confidently trusted to adhere to all of their international obligations, then I think I think it's a different conversation. But I don't think that's the world that that we live in, um, and. And that's why I think while the U.S. will follow international obligations that we sign on to, I, I don't think that our competitors and adversaries will necessarily do the same. And I think that's what makes it so difficult for the U.S. as a government, again, just my thoughts, to sign on to some of these things, because we will do it if we say we will do it. Um, but, but I do think you have to separate the, the, the remedies from uh, the obligations. And I think when you do that, you'll see when we're talking about starting armed conflict or things that will initiate armed conflict, it really boils down to core, core concerns a state has for its own security and essentially what will trigger a, a right of self-defense, you know, the inherent right of self-defense, as you know, we always throw in there. Um, and that's how conflicts are started. So it is useful if there are um, you know, binding agreements, because when a state deviates from them, I think it's pretty clear that they might have malevolent intent. When they are non-binding, non um, it is maybe less clear, but at least you still have a data point. And so I, I think a, a lot of the, the discussion about norms, um, and th this ties into what, you know, General Burt was talking about, um, I think a lot of the things that we can do either as, as law or policy are about communication. Um, Josh brought up zones. You know, I, I think you know declaring a keep out zone or or a, a zone of operations. I don't know that that is inherently. Um, you know, I, I think it has problems under Article One and Article Two of the Outer Space Treaty. However, as a communication tool, um, where you say that okay, I maybe can't declare this zone to keep everyone out, but I do want everyone to understand that if you approach in a certain way at a certain time, you know to a certain object, I will regard that as very threatening and that might trigger the inherent right of self-defense. So I think I think the, the rules and norms are incredibly value as a communication tool, even if not um, independently enforceable on their own, they're, they're kind of a derivative of, of a right to assert self-defense. Um, maybe if it's okay, I might ask a follow-on question, actually out of curiosity. Um, <laughs> The a related question for me is, um, how do we develop these rules and norms, especially uh, for military behavior? Uh, you know, there's been, uh, I've heard talk of the zones or how close is too close, what activities are permissible. Um, are we, is it gonna be a case by case basis that we kind of come up with uh, best practices and behaviors? And I could, it just as uh, some context from more the commercial side or the regulatory side, you know, we've kind of seen uh, two new norms starting to be picked up. One is for collision avoidance, when satellites are going to come dangerously close to another satellite. Uh, the rough rule that a lot of the industry uses is if it's going to be a one in 10,000 chance of a collision, they will probably move the satellites. And in general, the larger the constellations, uh, the more risk averse they are, the more they actually move, they want to preserve the space environment. 
And we're also seeing uh, technology means uh, we can shorten the decision timeline. So it used to be two to three days out, we make decisions. Now we can actually get down to 12 hours before the closest approach. So, um, so there's kind of one best practice coming together there. Uh, then on the regulatory side, uh, the New Zealand Space Agency is actually the first space agency in the world to monitor the satellites that they've licensed actually monitor them, monitor them in space and understand just the basic parameters. Are they in the orbits that they were licensed for? Are they roughly uh, you know, operating according to plan? Um, and it's kind of the notion of getting ahead of surprise. They want to know in advance just if something's happening so they can have a conversation, um, not necessarily impose a remedy, but just, just be aware. Um, and it's a little bit shocking because other space uh, regulators, they will um, review the paperwork before launch and give you a launch license. But then once you're in orbit, it's kind of fire and forget. Uh, so I think as space becomes uh, more um, uh, densely trafficked, monitoring what's going on in space, understanding the track record is going to become more important. Uh, and so we're just starting to see that uh, come into place as well. So I don't know if you have any examples on the military side of like, how do best practices or norms come into effect? Well, again, I mean, I think the, the, for me, the primary example I think of is the secretary's tenants and these specific behaviors that are nested under there. Uh, again, those are fairly generic. Uh, they don't prescribe, you know, 50 kilometers or, or a certain percentage of uh, probability of collision. Uh, but I, I, I think it's, it's a, an evolving area. You know, recently, I think it was the last week or two, the Chinese government released this study where they had said that you know the US GSAP program had spied on their mm. on their satellites several times. So that, that's their terminology, right? <clears throat> Whereas as General Bird said, the GSAP program's been public public and and its purpose as sort of a neighborhood watchdog of um, the geo belt has been you know made public for a long time. But it's I find that a kind of an interesting development of these norms of here's another state not saying that it's unlawful or even that it's irresponsible. I think the messaging they said was, well, we need more space domain awareness to, to understand uh, who's looking at what, when. And so again, to me, that's almost a movement towards a, a little bit more restrictive view and perhaps some sort of boundaries of, of, uh, of what they think would be appropriate. But in the military context, you know, one of the challenges that we talked about before is classification levels of this stuff. And, and there's reveal and conceal trade-offs that, um, that leaders are constantly weighing and trying to understand to what benefit, you know, what, what is the benefit of saying, you know, of put it, drawing a line out there saying, we think this is how close it is safe and responsible now versus, well, what might that be five or 10 years from now? And what does it vary for what the capability is and what orbit the capabilities are in? So with all those things, it, it's going to be, if anything, pro probably never get super specific. And to the extent it does, it, it probably would be fluid would be my guess. Yeah, and I think this is an area where um, it's easy to come up with really hard examples. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, the, there are many benefits to um, intermingling capabilities, uh, you know, letting the, the military utilize some of those commercial capabilities. But this is an area, kind of as you pointed out, where it makes it really hard to know, you know, what are you approaching? What, what is the other thing that that is doing? Um, and does the adversary or not even an adversary, does, it not, does the other craft know all of the things that you know about that craft? So um, you, you hit on a very hard area to create, you know, rules of behavior or norms. Um, but I think to your question, I think because of how intermingled we are, I think um, civil certainly, but commercial space and the military, I think there does have to be a common understanding because, you know, maybe in some domains there's, there, you know, on the sea, there might be a, a distance um, from which you can uh, approach a warship and you know, Hey, you know, you're going to make them uncomfortable and, and it might be closer for, for a commercial ship. You just don't have that fidelity of understanding in the space domain. So I think you have to basically go to the least common denominator for, for creating um, expectations and, and rules. But then there are some things where, um, you know, to Josh's point with uh, the secretary's tenets, you know, or, or even, you know, the, uh, the U.S., um, you know, not launching uh, kinetic ASAT tests. There are some things that are more straightforward that you can do. Um, and so we don't always have to focus on the really hard ones. Um, you know, there are some easier ones that I, I think um, we can do to create 
norms and standards of behavior that um, I say easy, maybe easy for the US and maybe some of our partners, but all that does is put good positive pressure on those who wanna do these things that we think are bad um, to maybe join up and stop doing it. So, um, you know, sometimes we have to take the, take the wins, uh, do, do the easier things, um, but there, as you noted, there's a lot of really hard out there too. Yeah, um, I have a follow up question to that. So basically, um, along those same lines, what decisions do you think um, will be affected um, by having that like access to better space domain awareness data for a set like spacecraft operators going forward in the same context of, of what was just asked? Maybe I can uh, dive in on some of the some of the ways uh, we've been helping satellite operators. So. Uh, launch is actually an area where that's been surprisingly risky, uh, actually deployment right after launch. So there's a lot of these ride share launches, you know, carrying tens to hundreds of satellites and a substantial fraction of the new kind of innovative satellites can go missing because they're not well tracked. Uh, quite often the um, precise trajectories are not published on spacetrack.org for about four weeks, which is generally uh, much too long for the satellite. The satellite is really missing by that point. Uh, so we've uh, had a substantial business locating satellites within hours after launch to help their satellite operators get in touch with them and also help figure out which one is theirs in the pack. You know, if there's 50 of them, it's quite a challenge to figure out, can be quite a challenge to figure out which one's yours. Um, there's also in uh, the realm of proximity operations on the debris removal side, there's a need for basically navigation information to get your satellite close to the piece of debris so that then your onboard systems can take over, can grab the object and get rid of it. Uh, and there's a need for independent validation. So if, the, if a company is saying, hey, I'm going to go to this satellite, I'm, you know, I'm going to do a commercial act on it rather than a military act, it's helpful to have an independent set of eyes. Uh, and we've seen space agencies funding those missions uh, interested in that uh, kind of independent uh, independent viewpoint. So, uh, and then just higher level strategically for the company, uh, when we look at the space domain awareness tracking systems across the globe, they're concentrated in the Northern hemisphere because most of them have their roots in the cold war, watching for missiles over the, you know, over the North pole uh, and it's left the Southern hemisphere uncovered. So satellites maneuver in the Southern hemisphere with the intent of not being spotted uh, conjunctions over the Southern hemisphere, um, you know, narrow misses are not as well tracked. So the safety situation's worse. So a big part of our effort has been putting radar systems in the Southern hemisphere to improve the tracking. And you know, I'm very happy to say we've got a pair of radars in uh, a radar site in uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and now Argentina as well to, uh, to cover that down. But uh, maybe that's more on the technical side, kind of where space domain awareness for Leo is, is headed. I, I, as I understood the, the question you're asking, what affects uh, improved space domain emeritus, what decisions that would, that would affect? I think from the military context, there is a, you know, the, the first thing I would think of is trying to discern intent of, of any sort of activity there. Is it just, is it benign? Is it uh, reconnaissance surveillance, or is there some sort of hostile intent there? I mean, that, that's, that's kind of the obvious one, but I, what I want to kind of point out with that is that whatever the space objects are doing, you know, if, if someone's trying to discern what the intent is, it's not just where these objects are located in space, it's the whole geopolitical context of, of what else is going on and what other intelligence might be that's wholly, that's related, but has really nothing to direct connection with, um, with those space objects. So space domain awareness, improved space domain awareness, obviously is, is super important for a component of that, but it's just one piece of many that a, um, that a decision maker would be putting together when they're trying to, to look at that in the, in the military context. So the, the panels, um, my name is Daniel Rothenberg from ASU. Um, so welcome to all of you, but the panel is space law and conflict. And one issue that hasn't really been raised so far is the degree to which armed conflict in the domain of space presents particular challenges that are distinct from the definition of armed conflict in other domains, you know, land and sea. So I'm wondering, how do you conceptualize armed conflict in the domain of space? Uh, and what particular challenges are there in, in, in defining armed conflict in ways that are, that, that reveal the particular, the, the specific challenges of the space domain? 
we've seen some of that in cyber, right? We understand cyber as being a space where what constitutes armed conflict is distinct. But what about space? And what are you all doing to clarify this issue? Um, I, I think, uh, well, like, like you pointed out in cyber and, and, and frankly, in, in every domain, um, it, things that are, there, there are obvious uses of forces, or obvious uses of force that will uh, pretty clearly trigger the armed attack threshold um, and, you know, trigger potentially armed conflict. You know, again, I should be clear, when we're talking about the use ad bellum, you know, the a state can assert a right of self-defense and engage in armed conflict, but it's always a, a decision that that state makes. And they're, they're governed by the principles of necessity and proportionality. Um, so it's never an automatic thing. Um, and in that context, I think we have to look at things in the space domain. Um, and, and I don't think there is a clear line. And I don't think that there is an appetite for states to create a particularly clear line. Um, you can do this to me and I will not react um, because a malevolent actor will go up to the line or, you know, just shy of the line and, and, and do that. Um, and you probably don't want that to occur. So um, I think that space, obviously unique in, in the, the physics, uh, you know, and in, in, in all the secondary implications of the things that we do. So I think we have to work through those, but I don't know that there's going to be a clear short of purposeful destruction of a satellite, um, I don't know that there's going to be an automatic, um, this constitutes armed conflict, much like in other other domains. Um, as far as the application of, of LOAC in, in space, should, should we find ourselves in, in armed conflict in space, which, and I, and I think General Burt stressed this, that's, that's not what the U.S. wants. That's not what really anybody who uses space wants. Um, you know, it might be lawful in certain contexts to, to be engaging in armed conflict at space, but it's not ever going to be a good thing um, for, for, for those who use space. So that's why so much emphasis is on deterring it and preventing it. Um, but, but anyway, I, I think, you know, we had the example earlier about debris. So it, let's say you, you uh, engage in a kinetic strike in space that, uh, that destroys a satellite or some other space object. It creates X amount of debris. Um, you know, that's going to be a challenge. And certainly, um, you, you, under the law of armed conflict, when you're doing an assessment of proportionality, and this is, of course, a, a different proportionality than you're talking about in the use ad bellum context, it's you're assessing, you know, what precautions can I take um, to avoid harm to civilians and civilian objects? And then when you are at the point of taking a strike, proportionality requires that you ensure that the, the collateral harm to civilians, civilian objects is not excessive relative to the military advantage anticipated. When you're doing that math, which is discretionary, um, you, you have to consider the harms to civilians and civilian objects. And I think a, a knowable debris result um, is part of that analysis. And that is obviously unique to space. Um, now, I, I think I might disagree with the degree of knowledge and understanding you have. Um, I, I don't think a, a kinetic act in space that causes debris is per se indiscriminate or, or illegal. Again, not good uh, and not not desirable, but I don't think that makes it illegal or indiscriminate. But but those are certainly factors that you would have to consider that are very unique to the domain. Yeah, I, I would build on that as well and say for proportionality in particular, I mean, I think the, the physics of the domain drive us towards thinking about that that particular LOAC principle. Um, the, the rule is that the expected harm to civilian objects uh, cannot be excessive with regard to the military advantage to be gained. And so that, what is the expected harm and to what degree do you have confidence in, in your concept of that expected harm, whether we're talking about some sort of kinetic activity or even just taking a satellite offline and what risks that might be um, attended to that. I think that kind of comes to this 
this concept, I think General Burt mentioned, there's this, we're working on a theory of success versus experience in warfighting. You know, we can take a howitzer into to a range and shoot it a thousand times and measure what happens with each round. And we can get a really good idea of what we expect that munition to do, that weapon, what its effects are. And we have a pretty good concrete example of it. Uh, where we, we may have a, a lot less confidence in that uh, in the space domain. It's the same rule that applies, but understanding how to put it into practice it is difficult. And to some extent, maybe, you know, thankfully, we don't, we don't have that experience to, to, to rely on, but it's a, you know, it's a good thing that we haven't been down that road, but it does make some challenges in the, um, in the actual application of it. Uh, thank you for this delightful panel. Uh, my name is Harvey Rushikoff. I'm with the American Bar Association. Um, one of the issues you have all raised is that, as you know, it is not as clear in cyber what a clear act of war is. And that's why we've written a lot of law reviews on the concept of the gray zone. And the issue that you are articulating is, which has both an upside and a downside, is strategic ambiguity. So it has advantages for the policymaker, but less advantage for those who like clarity, who are lawyers as to what the left and right margin is. So the one issue is, and also what we've said in cyber is the strategic ambiguity. We have said to the world that we will use cross domain responses. We, if it happens in cyberspace, we're not saying per se, we must respond in cyberspace. What I'm curious about the collective intelligence of the, of the panel is, should it not be better if we were a little bit more specific as to what the left and right margin would be? Wouldn't it be better if we had a better sense with our adversaries what our, we think a proportional response is beforehand so that we would know what to expect? So we don't have a, we, at this point, we, don't, we are fearful of a language of escalation with us not misperceiving. And what steps do you think we should be taking to fill and color in those dialogues with our adversaries so there would be a much more of a known response if X or Y happens? This is a possibility. It's not absolute, but it'll still be a policy decision. But that way we'll try to get out of this unintended escalation because of our lack of knowledge of having had a, a dialogue and a debate. And exhibit A is what's going on right now kinetically in, in Europe as to how we try to signal each other what's a appropriate response, which doesn't make us a co-combatant inside the experience. It's an easy question. So uh, <laughs> look forward to hearing your answers. Uh, so it, it is, I am a, I am an attorney and I like clarity, um, but you know, I interpret the law and give advice on the law for policymakers um, and policymakers, as you pointed out, need options. Um, and, and frankly, there are a lot of, there, there are a range of legal options. Um, and, and I, and I just, I'm not sure that there is an appetite to constrain those. And frankly, in order to do that, you know, as you were talking about, I, I think it ties into what I was talking about earlier with communication tools. If, if this happens, we're going to reserve the right to do X, Y, Z. I think that would be wonderful, but we would have to agree before something happens on what that X, Y, Z is. And there is often not uh, a strong impetus for firm agreement until that thing happens. And that's just how it is. Um, and, and so while I do think that would be great if there could be, um, you know, obviously it won't boil down to a checklist, you know, if, if this, then that, but having a, a menu of pre-approved options that, and that's not to say that there aren't considerations in advance, but that can be communicated. Um, I, I think there would be, I think there will be value in that. Certainly. Um, I just don't know that, um, again, it's a, it's a policy determination. I don't know that I see something so clear being articulated um, because frankly, the ambiguity is easier um, and, and it just leaves, leaves options open. Um, I, I just think that's more realistically how it will stay. I, I think one other advantage 
uh, that policymakers see on the ambiguity side is the is the downside of prescribing well obviously we're not talking about it if this then that type of scenario but the more it looks like that then you know the nefarious actor would try to achieve their goal by not accomplishing something on our if list and um so then you just kind of find yourself back in this sort of cat and mouse game of of a, just a different grade so now perhaps you've been able to define it you're able maybe you're able to constrain it by by laying that out but um there's again sort of this policy advantage of that ambiguity of well what what do we think is a proportionate response it might be a lot more severe than than you think it is and if we at least have that uncertainty in the in the actor's mind then perhaps that deters some of the malevolent activity but easy question and uh, I think I'll stop there on my answer for it. <laughs> Um, maybe I could just add uh, more on the technical perspective. Uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people often will think about a scenario that's a lot more representative of the geosynchronous belt. You know, so if you're out in the geosynchronous belt, there's uh, parking slots assigned by the ITU. You can kind of drift slowly from parking slot to parking slot, and so there's some time to anticipate dangers coming up. And I think it was about a decade ago, one of the um, GOES weather satellites had some sort of glitch and basically over the course of a few months drifted from the west coast of the US to the east coast. A few satellites got out of the way in response, but um, in a way it's kind of a low speed dance. Uh, in low earth orbit, uh, things are uh, a lot more dynamic. So satellites are not in a well-organized ring, they're going in all different directions and they're lapping the earth every 90 minutes. So if you're looking at a, um, a safety situation, like a high speed potential collision, a piece of debris coming near another satellite or two satellites coming, uh, uh, coming close to each other, um, we're in the game of looking about five days out into the future, trying to predict where these satellites are gonna be and predict that down to the level of like 10 meters, 20 meters. So these satellites are going to be making hundreds of laps around the Earth, and then we're trying to predict them down to a size about the size of this room, where the two are going to be, and is is that um, dangerous or not? So where the kind of state of the art stands is about uh, one, maybe two days out, you can make a prediction to within a kilometer or two of where the satellites are going to be, you know, and then you get down to about 12, 24 hours out, you can get down to kind of the 10 to 50 meters uh, sort of accuracy. Anything further in the future, if you're looking like four or five days, it's kilometers, tens of kilometers of uncertainty. So you're almost not even sure if the satellite's kind of in the vicinity of the other one. Um, there is a different scenario in the proximity operations. That's where one satellite is basically moved into the orbit of another satellite. Uh, that's a much slower dance. Excuse me, more like in uh, geosynchronous orbit. Uh, so for example, we saw uh, in 2020, the Russians uh, moving into position behind a US satellite. The initial maneuvers were six months prior uh, to the actual engagement. So, you know, six months prior, you see the satellite just kind of move orbits. And then you're in the game of looking at what else is in that orbit, not even necessarily anywhere close, but anywhere around the world, because there's going to be a slow drift uh, over the next few months. Um, and so that is less about precision. You know, is it going to be 10 meters away? Is it 20 meters away? And more of just what is in the same ring around the Earth. So. Question. So could you comment on the legality of placing weapon systems in outer space? I know we talked about the ambiguity aspect, whether there's it's a dual use technology or a satellite system, but we are kind of unambiguous when it comes, for instance, to direct energy weapons, missiles, low power laser systems, or counter space electronic warfare capabilities, which are designed to be offensive and defensive. So they do have a dual use, um, and they're weapon systems, and yet they seem to contradict the normative aspect of the outer space, uh, outer space treaty, which says that, well, space is designed to be used for outer, uh, for peaceful purposes. Um, so um, there's a normative aspect, which state practice uh, seems to violate given that the big three powers, the United States, China, and Russia are actively supposedly placing weapon systems in orbit. Um, could you clarify your position on legal perspective or position on, um, on the legality of weapon systems in outer space under current international law? Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, you're, you're citing to the, the preamble language, which is aspirational and that's, Great and 
space should be um, encouraged to be used for peaceful purposes. Um, but uh, if you're looking at the hard prohibitions, it's on weapons of mass destruction, and that's from Article 4. So I, I, I don't think that a lot of the things that you're talking about are prohibited. Now, if you want to um, look at future you know, treaties and if states can agree to uh, you know, not, not weaponize space, that's certainly something that is under discussion in the UN. I think there are some fundamental flaws in the approach that's, that's being taken there. Um, but I think that's a, and frankly, even the, the discussion of, you know, the prevention of arms um, race in outer space or, or the, the PPWT, those things, they inherently recognize that there is no prohibition on weapons in outer space. I mean, obviously you wouldn't need it if, if it was already prohibited. So, um, I, I think that is an aspiration, and that will be wonderful. But I think that um, we are in a world where we have to ensure our ability to continue to use the domain. And th the only way to do that is through deterrence at this point. And so, you know, we need to have options to to deter. Um, and, and just to be clear, it's not prohibited under under any of the law that I that I know of. Is there one more question? Just to go, go, quick, excuse me, go quickly back to the um, strategic ambiguity. Um, it sounds like, you know, we're talking about the cyber domain um, and how we can have these persistent attacks and we can generally ignore them or not have to do some sort of proportional response. But obviously space is a physical space. So if we're seeing persistent space conflict, is that not in a way space war? You know what, I'm going to exercise moderator's discretion here and answer this one because I think this is sort of the underlying question to the whole to the whole um, panels, you know, why are we talking, is there, an, is there a concern about applying law of armed conflict to outer space because that instantly applies that there is going to be conflict in space. So I think this is what it's getting at. You know, the answer to that is, well, you know, it's better to have the, the laws that exist that tell us how to conduct ourselves in that domain than to say something like it won't happen. So, you know, let's, let's, let's say that it doesn't apply. So I think one of the biggest issues that we have in space is really this question of, of grey zone conflict. So, you know, the issue is, and we've talked about it really all day, is that a, a very risky thing is conflict can arise when we don't know what somebody else is doing or why they are doing that. And so, so the issue of grey zone conflict is, is, is very, very present, probably, you know, more so than, you know, outright kinetic destruction. But I think the other thing, and, and General Burt was very clear about this, is that what, that what we were talking about is not effects in space, but effects on Earth. So certainly we're concerned about effects on space, but effects on space can have immediate impact on Earth. And so again, when we're talking about war and space, you know, the general public, you know, view might turn to, you know, oh, it's going to be war up on the surface of the moon or something like that. So I suppose that that what I want to do is slightly turn around your question and put the, like the positive spin on it and, and pick again up on what um, General Burt had to say when she said that we we don't talk about space in the way that the average, and she said taxpayer understands, but you know the average person um, understands. So what I what I want to do is sort of take take your question, Chase, and kind of put it to the panel now and just say, how do we communicate better about what about what we're doing in space in a responsible way so that we can kind of hopefully quell some of those overarching concerns about why we're talking about law of armed conflict in space. So how can we, how can we, um, yeah, how can we communicate better to the average person instead of saying war, space, you know, destruction, how can we say actually better what it is that we're, what we're doing and why, why we are, um, why we want to say that, that LOAC applies and, and why, why these things are all about being responsible rather than being destructive. Well, I can, uh, one piece of that, uh, we, uh, at Leo Labs, we believe that bringing transparency uh, to space, to space activities is going to be a critical element of that. So uh, having a commercial 
uh, actor who, independent of a military organization, actually reporting what they see going on, uh, I think sets a good precedent. So if you're going to be act, uh, active in space, your activities will be reported. And if you're going to do something risky or something threatening, the activities will be reported. And then they can be discussed publicly. And actually, the Cosmos 1408 uh, anti-satellite weapons test was a great example. You know, the um, uh, over a year ago now, uh, Russia fired a missile and blew up one of its own satellites. Uh, and uh, for about four days, uh, Leo Labs was the only data being put out there in the public sphere. Uh, U.S. Space Force came out with a statement that an event had happened and they saw so much debris, but nothing to back it up. Um, we had journalists asking us uh, what what proof there was, what uh, new risks uh, were created in orbit. And we were able to say within hours that uh, the new debris was actually threatening both space stations, the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station, and that counteracted the official press release that came out of Russia saying nobody was at risk. It was a benign weapons test. Uh, and so I think um, as more and more commercial satellites, scientific satellites and military satellites are operating together, um, having a, a foundation of transparency will at least help everybody better communicate what is happening? Take down some of the opportunity for surprise. Yeah, I know we're short on time, so just to build on that a, a, a touch, the transparency to perhaps message instead of what is irresponsible, perhaps sharing more messaging about what is responsible behavior in space. It may not always be the most exciting uh, thing to report or, or describe, but I think that that can go a long ways in part because one of the challenges in any of that messaging is the trustworthiness of it. And we just talked about the GSAP program. You know, the, the US is pretty adamant about that being a very benign program and not everyone buys into that. And so that's an, a prime example of an effort to, to try to have some responsible behavior, uh, but maybe a, a messaging effort that is falling a little bit short on that. And I think just to, to your question about how do we re-articulate it, I, I think fundamentally what we, the U.S. wants to do is be able to use space for exploration, for human achievement, for commercial purposes, and for, um, you know, terrestrial national security. We, there are great intelligence uses for, for outer space, um, and we want to be able to do all of those things. And so... The, the, and even the idea that was touched on this morning of what is space superiority, really at its core, when the military talks about superiority, it is, it's the ability to operate without interference in a domain. We just wanna be able to do that exploration, that commercial activity, that, that national security intelligence, act, those activities without interference. And so the, the, all the things that we're talking about in preventing a war is really about making sure that folks cannot take away our ability to do those things. Okay, thank you so much for that. And we are now at time. Um, I'm very grateful to my fabulous panel, um, Joshua, Dan, and Matt. Thank you so much for making yourself available. And it's been a great discussion. Thank you to everybody who helped me organize and get the, the incredible um, panel. So thank you very much. And um, thank you to ASU for hosting us. Thank you. So we're a little bit uh, ahead of schedule, so that is good news. So we'll take a short uh, break until 2.15 uh, rather than 2.30. So if you want to grab a quick coffee and then we'll get the, the last panel going at 2.15. And thank you all so much.
Yeah. Yeah, we'll, pretty compliant. Yeah. yeah, we'll give them a couple minutes. Towards the end, if you want to sort of discuss the whole thing for panel, I don't know if you want to share a few thoughts around the event in the end of the day. We'll say a few words also, and then I'll close it out. Okay. Final thank you. All right. We should be done, you know. No worries. So, should I? So, Daniel knows he's going to be, I'm going to call on him to make a few comments. Uh, <laughs> okay. Say what? You can. You can. I'm ready. <laughs> Okay. All right, Taryn. Hey, Taryn, you, you can use your best command voice to get everybody to quiet down. This is on, I think. 
Is this on now? I think. Who are we missing? We're missing. Who are we missing? All right, everyone. I will invite you to regain your seats. Thank you for our final panel. Who are we? Uh, <laughs> okay, welcome back. The uh, this is the final panel of the afternoon. So we appreciate uh, your uh, support today and the fact that you're sticking around here to the end. What we're going to talk about in the final panel today is something that we've been sort of scratching around all day, which is deterrence and how and and how should we be thinking about deterrence in space uh, and how do we uh, how do we kind of wrap our hands around the relationship between deterrence as a as a uh, understanding deterrence psychologically and understanding it technically and th those two things can tend to be separate uh, but they do uh, th they do in fact come together a couple of things about deterrence before we get started we realize that when we attempt to deter for example china we are not deterring china writ large or deterring the pla we are deterring g specifically the deterrence is, is focused on changing someone's behavior because of whatever uh, rationale they use to determine whether or not something is worth the risk of doing something else okay so the 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 chinese have a have a strategy that they've been employing that's known as a fait accompli and and what the uh, intent is that they would for example occupy a small rock in the South China Sea and militarize it. And they would build an airfield. They would be able to, to build facilities for military operations. The bet is that it will not be worth the risk to us, to the US, to attempt to push them off that rock. So in effect, that is a form of deterrence on the part of the Chinese. When we think about deterrence, we tend to think about in the US deterrence by denial. We tend to think about denying the enemy something and therefore we will deter them. The Chinese, at least in the open source writings that they have, tend to think about deterrence as a form of coercion. So there's a very different way of looking at it. We in the US don't tend to think about deterrence as coercion, more as denial. I won't, you won't do something as opposed to I'm gonna force you to do something you don't wanna do. So, We'll keep that in mind as we as we continue the conversation. The other thing that I would uh, ask you to think about is so the, the currently the administration's policy is called integrated deterrence, right? Whatever that means, and it seems to mean um, something different to just about everybody. There's a common sense way of looking at it, saying, well, integrated deterrence must be the integration of all of the factors of national security to include our allies, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that's a good way to look at it. I don't know, but think about integrated deterrence in the in the sense in which we're going to talk about about the, about deterrence. The again, the the last point is that you know Thucydides was right, and nobody's been able to prove him wrong since he wrote the Peloponnesian Wars. Countries go to war for three things, right? For honor, hubris, and self-interest. And we've yet to prove that to be incorrect. If you look at all the wars of the 20th century, you'll find on either or both sides of the belligerent uh, map, that tends to be the case. And it tends to be the case still to this day. So when we think about deterrence, again, remember that the credible capacity to coerce someone to do something or to deter them from doing something is in the minds of the people we're trying to deter. It's not us. So as we think about deterrence, we, for instance, look at the Chinese and, and we will tend to broad forecast or broadcast our values and worldview on them and say, well, this would deter me because I'm a rational actor and I grew up in, in the Western context where I uh, assimilate deterrence to this particular way of behavior. Yet 
we might find the more we realize and the more we know about an adversary that they don't use those same kinds of um, metrics, if you will, to, de to determine what kind of behavior they're going to have or whether it's going to deter them at all. So again, as we transition into this world of space, and we've mentioned this earlier in the, in the world of cyber, and I was involved in those discussions very early on, just reacting to something in the world of cyberspace that came at us was something that we fought very hard not to put in writing because it's just, it doesn't make sense to us in that, to confine our, our reaction to something in that one particular domain. So with that in mind, our panelists today, and uh, I am fortunate to be able to run two of these panels today. Uh, the, the three folks that we have today match pretty much what we've been doing today, trying to get somebody from government, somebody from industry, and somebody from academia or the, the, the think tanky world here. So uh, Colonel Dan Sanders is the deputy director in, uh, of strategy and plans for the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. He is, uh, in his current position, what he does is he aligns the Department of Defense's efforts to align space strategic messaging in support of integrated deterrence, right, to the point that I was making a minute ago. Uh, he served for 20 odd years in a, uh, in a variety of military space operations position, including as a commander of, a, uh, of the 4th Space Force or Space Control Squadron. Um, he also holds a PhD in military strategy from the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, the same school that we were talking about that uh, Deanna Burt, General Burt had been to as well. So again, a deep knowledge of strategy, but he's also a practitioner and he's somebody that's been out in the world doing things. So we look forward to hearing, to hearing his comments. And Dr. Namrata Goswami, hopefully I, Goswami, hopefully I, I got close, I apologize is an independent scholar on space policy and great power politics. She is a faculty associate at the Thunderbird School of Management at Arizona State University for their executive masters in global management. Uh, she was awarded a Minerva grant by the Office of the Secretary of Defense to study great power competition in outer space. So the Minerva grants are something that are, that are given out that are extraordinary and they, they tend to look at really sort of changing, big changing, big thoughts, deep thoughts kinds of, uh, kinds of things. So the fact that she did that on exactly what we're talking about this, this morning or this afternoon, which is great power competition in outer space. She's testified before the US China Economic and Security Review Commission on China's space program. And she has published a book recently in 2020 called The Scramble for the Skies, a great power competition to control resources in outer space. So what could be more timely than what we're talking about today? And, and at the end of the table, Eric Brown is the Vice President, Lockheed Martin Strategy and Advanced Capabilities, Communications, Position uh, and Timing and Space Security. He is the Vice President of Mission Strategy and Advanced Capabilities at Lockheed Martin, Space Communication uh, and Space Security. In, his, in the capacity that he has now, he's responsible for leading the company's development of end-to-end -end solutions, architectures, space segment, ground control segment, et cetera, in partnership with operators. So again, Lockheed Martin is the biggest defense contractor on the planet, and they are the most involved in this particular uh, domain that we are talking about here. Uh, in his capacity, he's worked very closely with defense, intelligence, civil, and commercial space operators. The, um, and to, uh, to include uh, and contributed to Lockheed Martin's breadth of expertise in today's space-related challenges. So we are going to conduct this uh, panel the, the same way that we did the first one. I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to give us uh, a couple of minutes on what they consider to be their area of expertise and their focus for today, very similar to what Melissa asked, which was tell me what keeps you up at night. So what are the big rocks that are in your rucksack? What are the things that you are most concerned about? And after they give their introductory comments, we will begin to do the Q&A. So without further ado. Uh, thank you for having me. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I learned a lot actually in all the panels and the keynote that we heard. So uh, my area of expertise, as was mentioned, is looking at 
uh, the grand strategic thinking in space, especially China, India, and the United States space program. And so uh, in, in that context, what is uh, important for today's panel, I think, is to first of all, how do we define deterrence? So uh, we heard that deterrence has different connotations from different countries. So the very simple definition of deterrence is, of course, to deny someone from doing something that you do not want them to do. And there are two different uh, theoretical conceptions of deterrence from a Western literature. One is deterrence by denial, where you deny your competitor or adversary from engaging in activities you do not want them to do. And second is to ensure that they know that if they engage in such an activity, they will be punished for it. So it's a very clear conceptual distinction that deterrence has. Now, China's uh, conception of deterrence differs a little bit. So when you think about China's engagement uh, since it was established in 1949, including in small wars, as well as uh, in the Taiwan scenario and the South China Sea Island, which was mentioned, China's conception of deterrence is based on compellence. So they engage in a behavior that they want to compel you to behave in a way that they want you to behave. And so it's a completely different understanding of how deterrence strategy is thought through. Now, when I think of India's assessment of deterrence, it's based on this famous classic, which you must have heard of, called Kautilya's Arthasastra. And in India's conception, deterrence means you have one grand strategic vision. So by which you mean that you engage in a particular understanding of the world and what you want the world to be, which is very Isaiah Berlin kind of philosophy, which is the hedgehog. So you have a grand pattern of what you think should work out. And then you have very detailed assessment of who will be your partners and who will be your allies. So it's a very clear understanding of how deterrence works. And so if you think about it from the context of today, I would say that how does space fit in? to this conceptual framing that I have done in terms of deterrence. So there are two very important roles that nations view as critical. One is defense of the homeland, and second, defense against attacks or territorial aggressions of their partners and allies. And in my view, space already plays a critical role. So I would argue that space should not be seen as a domain in its own right, but actually something that adds to the overall grand strategic capability of a nation. And so in that, what space does is that it adds to advanced warning, missile uh, tracking, overhead sensing that lets us know if an adversary nation is engaging in a particular activity, uh, and then to make that impossible for them to do. And once deterrence fails, then of course you have to engage in more offensive or compellence behavior. I think what is important is, is that space is also added to stability, but because space adds to the overall intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capability that adds to your deterrence, that you understand what an adversary is doing, it actually creates the particular uh, doctrine or training that helps you in building that deterrence. And so by which I mean, it creates stability. And then finally, what is very important, and I'll end with that, is that today, when you think about deterrence, it cannot be just a state activity. Commercial firms, especially commercial space firms, play a very critical role. In fact, when I see how the Ukrainian military has uh, functioned in Russia, I, listening to Chinese strategic thinking and Russian conversations, I don't think they anticipated the level of support that uh, Starlink constellation would have given to add to the deterrence capability and uh, defense capability of the Ukrainian military. And so space is a very critical force multiplier when it comes to deterrence. So I'm going to end there. And Perfect. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dan Sanders, I'm a Space Force member, but assigned to the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. The Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy here after ASD, so I don't have to keep uh, keep saying that mouthful, is charged with space warfighting policy for the department. This stems from the congressional direction that not only um, established U.S. Space Command and later Space Force, but this acknowledgement that space is a warfighting domain and that policy needs to adapt to a change in the security environment. So under that broad umbrella, um, I'm deputy director for our strategies, and we just had a recent change, but our strategies and analysis team, and where we focus on what we should be doing and why. And that means in practice that we contribute to national level uh, strategic documents and guidance documents, 
like the NSS, the NDS, and, and things like that. We also participate in interagency and, and multinational uh, forums like the UN. But my area, as uh, the general said, is space strategic messaging. That, that's my, my focus and how that plays into to integrated deterrence. And it's relevant to today's topic because deterrence, as, as we heard earlier, is premised on this idea that we need to shape how uh, an adversary thinks about a thing. What are, what are their perceptions? How do they perceive the, the world? And so strategic messaging, for, for my view, is not just the things that we say, but also what we do. We create observable signatures. We, we do things that our, our adversaries take note of, whether we talk about them publicly or not. So what we aim to do is convince our adversaries that they're not going to achieve uh, their political objectives through military means, and that if they are to attack our space systems, that, that they won't achieve those objectives and the costs associated with that outweigh the benefits. So just fundamental deterrence as it's applied to space. And, and space is a critical pillar to inter, integrate deterrence, as Namrata talked about, and we heard from General Burr earlier, space is essential to uh, the way of our way of life as Americans, and we're committed to a safe, secure, sustainable, and stable domain for all, all nations. Space capabilities are also critical to the American way of war. They help us see globally, command forces around the world, um, and provide critical decision advantage. So earlier we heard about John Boyd's OODA loop, uh, the, our ability to observe, orient, decide, and, and act more quick, quickly than our adversaries. And our world-class space uh, assets have, have become the envy of the world. We have the most effective fighting force in, in history. Our competitors have taken note and they have developed capabilities to challenge those advantages. And in the case of the PRC in particular, they've also built their own space architecture, uh, a wartime architecture that will help them communicate with their own forces to see over the horizon uh, to to communicate with weapons platforms and really to keep us out of a conflict in the, the Indo-Pacific. But, but to be clear, conflict with China in space or anywhere else is not inevitable. And that said, the national security strategy makes clear that, that the PRC seeks to reimagine the world order in, in their favor, that they want to change the international order and they're developing capabilities in space to help them do that. China publicly advocates for the peaceful use of space and agreements in, in the UN, but meanwhile, we see that they are building, are, they're developing and fielding counter space technologies. And so their goal is obvious. They want to use space to challenge our ability to intervene militarily in a, a conflict in the Indo-Pacific. So the rise of these threats um, has shown us that we must be able to protect and defend our critical space systems and services but also we need to protect our joint force from hostile uses of space, those things that might help track, target, and kill surface forces. So those threats were the impetus for the reconstitution of Space Command, uh, the creation of the Space Force, and the ASD for space policy. So preventing war in space is not an idle academic topic. It's timely, it's important, and I look forward to learning from my fellow panelists and from the audience so thank you to ASU for hosting us. I think this is a really important event and I appreciate everything. Thank you, General Schmidl. And thanks to everyone for, uh, for coming out for, for this entire day. It's been a lot of fun. I've certainly learned a lot through the course of it. I'm gonna kind of tie on to a couple of the points that uh, the other panelists were talking through in terms of you know, what is the, the thought process behind deterrence in space? How should we be thinking about it in terms of um, uh, a domain unto itself or an integrated uh, environment. Maybe as a starting point around that, thinking through a few of the, the explicit ways in which we're using space uh, right now and why this becomes a very salient topic. We've, we've implicitly been talking about it all day. People have danced around it, but what are we really referring to? In 1943, uh, we had strategic bombing raids on Germany. And at that point in time, uh, we had roughly a 25% hit rate against strategic targets. Now, the important part of this is that at the time we defined a, a hit as something landing within a half a mile of the target object. 25% of the time, we landed within a half a mile radius of what we wanted to hit, we call that success. 
in this reason, if you go to, to Germany, a lot, of, a lot of cities, you know, effectively are only 50 years old. In 2011, during the Arab Spring, uh, we had strategic bombing uh, against Libya. At that point in time, we had a 98% hit rate. And we defined that as within a meter of the target. 98% of the time, we were able to put a, uh, a munition on target within a matter of, of me to the front row here. The, the big difference that, that came into effect there was GPS as one critical piece of it. The fact that we were able to identify specifically uh, where something was and where our munitions were uh, with relation to that. As Dan was mentioning, our adversaries have seen that kind of success. The Chinese began watching what we were doing uh, in the Balkans in the 1990s uh, and began trying to, to emulate that and uh, have done an exceptional job. But not just trying to, to emulate what we're doing, but to, to deny us the ability to use those space capabilities. So when we far, start talking about uh, deterring conflict in space, I would, I would actually offer that we're ask, asking the wrong question. What we really need to be talking about is how do we use our capabilities in space as a lever to deter conflict more broadly from a, from a strategic perspective. Our ability to continue exercising force in various parts of the world uh, is what has kept uh, our, our adversaries from trying to, to run, uh, run asunder, um, you know, taking Taiwan back at a much earlier date. We've been able to, to compel them in the Chinese thought process from pursuing some of those ends, but that's, that's only gonna last for so long. So that takes us to some of this discussion of combat or conflict on orbit. Uh, one of the areas that I specifically look at is the space superiority that we've been talking about all day. Uh, that's what keeps me up at night is how we actually prosecute those kinds of, of conflicts on orbit should they arise. And we've, we've recognized, as, as you've heard, that our adversaries are fielding capabilities to begin taking out our space assets. So. Consequently, we've been begun developing architectures and capabilities that will allow us to continue operating through. And it's important that we continue to build, out, build, build that out, not from the standpoint of an arms race, but from the standpoint of making the adversary unsure that they could actually take out the thing that has been uh, an advantage to us from a broader strategic perspective for the last really 30 to 40 years. So as, as we're talking through the rest of this panel, I, I look forward to to talking through how we navigate those waters and understanding not only how do we, how do we prevent a shot fired in space, but really how do we prevent, uh, how do we use space to prevent the shots fired elsewhere? Okay, those are some great opening comments. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna address the uh, question to the panel here, and then we're gonna throw it open to everyone else. So Eric, I'd like, to, I'd like to build on what you just mentioned about using space as a lever to deter in all other domains. So if we hold that thought for a second, two questions. Is there one, is there a useful analogy to another weapon system in, in another domain that might be of value in this conversation? So for example, even though nuclear weapons are not a domain in and of themselves, they certainly are a unique capability. And one could argue historically, that many people have, that the advent of nuclear weapons has actually made the world in some ways a safer place because the major superpowers, us and the Russians, fought a series of proxy wars, or we have been over the last number of years. And, the, and the, the next question I would ask you to think about is whether or not you believe that red lines are an effective way to create a deterrence policy. So, Namrata, let's uh, start with you, if you could. If you got some thoughts on those two questions. I think I'm going to address the second part. Okay. So, in terms of uh, red lines. So, uh, I mean, when we, when we declare red lines, for example, we saw that in, happening in Syria. Just take, let's say, the example of Syria, right? The usage of uh, chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the Assad regime, and then uh, uh, a response mechanism gets complicated and difficult because of the inability to actually create coalition or to be able to have a regime change, right? So, for example, so did you deter uh, if you had red lines? Uh, it was not very clear. 
So now let's take the example of a more contemporary case, which is Russia in Ukraine. So uh, when I think about bettering Russia, we all knew that Russia had already told the world in 2008 that the uh, Ukraine and that particular area is within their sphere of influence. The famous Medvedev speech that was followed by uh, Russia's national security doctrine as well as their military doctrine. In fact, Russia even told you that they might, uh, they had this uh, strategy of nuclear escalation to de-escalate. So they would include nuclear weapons in their thinking on warfare to, to utilize it in a local conflict. But that was signaling, right? That was posture so that they would deter a uh, counter uh, to their aggression. So did deterrence work there? Could we stop the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Uh, in my context, and we did have red lines. One of the red line is the United Nations Charter 2.4 that tells you that you cannot uh, act in, in an aggressive way because there'll be a response mechanism, mm -hmm. but we didn't, it didn't work, yeah. right? So red lines are only as viable as the capacity for deterrence to either punish or to deny. So you might think that we are punishing Russia right now, or uh, we are denying them uh, full uh, takeover of Ukraine. But the concern then is that, uh, will that actually lead to Russia leaving those territories and having that uh, territorial boundary we had before February 24, 2022. So, so in that context, having red lines can actually limit you at times and might not deter the other nation. Yeah, the, the idea of red lines, I think, is problematic for a lot of the reasons that Namrata laid out. But but I'd also say, back to the the earlier talk about how we, we don't have a long combat history with, with space by which we, we have analogies that I think are necessarily relevant. And so, you know, would a nation go to war because a, a satellite was shot down Likely not. I mean, there was a there was a point made in the, the legal panel earlier that all of these decisions can't be done independent of the larger geopolitical context and what's going on elsewhere. And so I, I don't know that, you know, if, for a red line to work, you've got to have a, a credible threat, a mechanism to follow through on it, and you have to have the will to follow through on that. And And I think that that's really hard to do absent you know, an empirical data set where we know how countries would re respond to that. So I'm gonna pick up that first question that you asked, which was that analog to the nuclear environment. And, you know, when it comes to, to deterrence, I mean, I consider me a, a classical deterrence theorist in the, in the vein of Thomas Schelling and those folks. And really thinking about from, from a pure game theory perspective, because that's really, you know, where a lot of this uh, originated and this belief that if the adversary didn't have confidence that they would be able to decapitate us immediately, and in fact, that there would be some counter, that that in itself served a deterrent effect. So as we've built out architectures now applying to, this, to the space environment, as we've built out architectures, one of the keys has been to, to have a demonstrable uh, ability to defend against the, you know, the threat of a decapitation. Um, and again, taking it to a broader environment that, they can't believe that they'll be able to remove all of our ISR satellites or that, you know, looking at anything closer to home from the nuclear side, the idea that they could remove our missile warning capabilities, which are expressly for the purpose of detecting and, and attributing a nuclear launch to an adversary so that our president would have knowledge and be able to, to respond accordingly. Um, so being able to, to preserve those things, those capabilities has become absolutely uh, imperative. Now, taking it to the question of red lines, though, I, I would have to agree that, that they uh, pose a, a number of, of real practical challenges. One is that they can become very limiting uh, and potentially back you into a corner um, when, when stated explicitly. The second piece, and I'll take the, the GPS example again, you know, we start talking about the threat of, of taking down a satellite of, of uh, shooting one down, what we, how do we respond to that? But in fact, in the case of GPS, if they simply spoofed it and created a crisis of, of confidence in the constellation for some period of time, 
the Chinese objective is really to replace it with the Baidu constellation to begin with. And so is that potentially a graver act of war in some respects than potentially removing a single satellite? Um, likewise, now to the context point, if, if those satellites, that single satellite is crucial to the survival of a fleet trying to get inside the first island chain, then you're in a very different situation. So you have to look at that broader set of context versus saying, okay, we're going to explicitly have a red line that has this set of characteristics when really it's going to be backed against what's the ultimate outcome that, that uh, our adversaries are, are going for. So uh, when, when uh, Eric was speaking, I was thinking that uh, there, is, there are two other things we need to keep in mind when we think about red lines and deterrence, right? So uh, one is, of course, satellite systems that are already in orbit, but what happens if an adversary, uh, Dan was also speaking about that, what, what happens uh, if an adversary takes it out? Let's say they didn't use kinetic weapons or anti-satellite, but non-kinetic, right? Or, or they used uh, laser or they used... Uh, uh, power microwave uh, uh, capability uh, that destroyed the electronics. So is the United States prepared? Do we have a launch on demand? Uh, do we have satellites in storage that can immediately replace the satellites that have been taken off? So that would actually play into your entire deterrence mm -hmm. strategy as well. So I yeah, I'd, I I'd actually, have to, I'd, I have to push back a little bit on, on that one, um, get a little bit of, cross panel uh, going on. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk about tactically responsive space for the last handful of years. Um, and the idea that uh, we could employ launch on demand in order to reconstitute capabilities that were taken down. Unfortunately, the upshot of that is that every launch pad that is able to provide that now becomes a strategic target. You've now shifted the, the target surface away from you know, the, the Western Pacific or things on orbit Instead, now, you know, Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg Air uh, Space Force Base are targets. And so trying to begin relying on those kinds of things basically puts you at greater risk of, of, of an escalation that no one really wants to see at the point where it becomes a strategic asset. Not to mention the operational timetables time, time become really problematic if you're talking about a 72-hour, 96-hour Taiwan Strait scenario. So we're just going to wrap two two more points, and we'll go to the questions. So the the, the um, discussion Eric was having a minute ago about nuclear weapons, if you remember back way back in the day, and we now know the rest of the story since it's been declassified. When Reagan, President Reagan, mentioned the Strategic Defense Initiative, he did it on national television without any pre-briefing, without any warning. So we were going to create an initiative that would be able to intercept the missiles. Well, it didn't take a rocket scientist and it didn't take the Russians 20 hours, 24 hours to realize that that was going to call into question the entire uh, mutual assured destruction um, theory, if you will, that we had been operating under as a form of deterrence with the Russians. So that just in, in the deterrence world. And the, the last point, again, you know, Eric was talking before about GPS, right? So you don't, if our weapon systems are very reliant on GPS, you don't have to take it away as much as you have to make it so that the operators don't believe that it's credible. If, and therefore that runs all the way up the food chain. So our way of war, the US way of war is to apply precision effects on precision on individual targets with the bigger theory that if we hit those targets, it's gonna cause the system, and you hear this and read this all the time, this is the way the Joint Staff talks about it, the enemy system is going to collapse. Well, if you don't have the ability to target that precisely with confidence, then what does that do to our ability to conduct that kind of war, which we believe is in fact a deterrence to our adversaries because it's a capability that they don't have and can't defend against. So these are awesome points. And uh, that with that, we could, we could talk amongst each other all afternoon, but we want to throw it open for questions and uh, have somebody got something that they are dying to ask. We did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, got it. Hi, thank you. Um, 
great discussion. Uh, we've talked about China increasing their own space capabilities as well. Um, what is your view on whether or not that actually deters them from a kinetic strike in space because now they are potential victims of their own debris? Um, and what sort of parity uh, in terms of a stalemate Cold War sort of uh, mentality uh, does the expansion of China uh, into space uh, present for us? Sound, yeah, so, so I, I would offer that I think we do a really poor job generally of uh, putting ourselves in the adversary's shoes in part because we, we find ourselves mirroring, you know, having a, a mirroring bias to a tremendous de degree. The Chinese, uh, unlike, unlike where we've been in terms of creating a dependence on space over the last 40 years, the Chinese are certainly enabled by space. Uh, but I wouldn't call it a dependence. If we look at, at capabilities like you know, the hypersonic glide vehicles that they tested uh, in July of 2021, um, you know, there certainly is, is a likely space connection there, but you know, is it entirely dependent? Probably not. Um, and so when we start looking towards what the Chinese are going to be driving from their objectives, they're, they're typically very... Um, very targeted in what they want to achieve, and they're willing to employ what means are necessary in order to achieve those things. So, where we would draw, um, uh, where we would create a lot of concern uh, internally about uh, polluting space, things like that, I don't think that we can necessarily assume that put in the right strategic context where they're trying to achieve specific uh, national strategic goals, that they would view that as a, as an end all be all. Uh, bright line. Yeah, the CSO General Saltzman's talked about this a little bit that that PRC, of course, is using more space, but do they have so they have more to lose than they did 10 years ago, of course. But do they have more to lose than us if space were to go com go away completely? Well, in a regional conflict, and the, the PRC is, you know, to use the, the sports analogy, they're they're playing a home game and between their onshore radars and over the horizon radars, uh, long range standoff weapons that, that may or may not use space, um, they're able to project power much more effectively, even if space completely goes away. And so I, I don't think we can discount, you know, how important do they view the interest of say Taiwan and what they are willing to do to, to achieve that and what that risk might mean to the space domain. And, and you know, I guess to Eric's point, it's, I, we, we can't assume that they are gonna make that the same logic that, that we might as a rational actor that depends on the space domain. And of course we wouldn't want to, um, to make the domain unsustainable because we, we use that. I, I don't know that that logic would hold. I think that's a great question. So I actually took part in a, a simulation exercise where I played China. And so the exercise was where one of China's ally, North Korea, would do a nuclear detonation to take out certain constellations. And uh, many of my colleagues who were global actually wouldn't engage in that behavior because of the fact that as China, there were two things we had to consider. One was, of course, that our own military was getting more dependent on space support. Uh, but as Dan and Eric pointed out, it's more a regional conflict. The U.S. has to support forces out of line, far away, whereas China probably wouldn't have to do, but that doesn't mean Taiwan is just around the corner. It's still, you have to cross oceans, uh, cross the sea. But uh, what was interesting is that the other insight we got was that in that particular scenario, uh, China is also dependent on a civilian side. They have a huge market, a huge population that depends on space support. The Beidou Navigation System supports members of the Belt and Road Initiative. So there will also be careful uh, in, in terms of uh, creating so much obstacles in space that reduces their own capability to use it. So we are actually in a very interesting situation. On one hand, uh, when I listened to or talked to my Chinese colleagues when I did field work there, including from the Academy of Military Sciences, they, uh, they're in, in discussions, what became clear was that from a 
from a military doctrinal perspective, they viewed the US as conventionally much more superior. And one way that they could limit that capability was to target space support, right? That's very clear in their thinking. But inadvertently, they're also becoming dependent on space. So we have to wait and see. But in a Taiwan-like scenario where they see that as a core interest, territorially important, President Xi has connected it to national rejuvenation, they will actually have alternate mechanisms of supporting military deployment. We see this with the border in India, where uh, when uh, you have in, you're in the higher Himalaya, sometimes they have acted in a way that has used local support. So I see that unfolding. Thank you. So the question you would have to ask yourself is whether or not you believe that a conflict with China could be or would be confined to the Taiwan area. And I would fall down on the side of saying that's probably not a good assumption, that if we go to war with China, it's likely to spread, which means that the Chinese calculus on what they could do in space might be slightly different, because in fact, they would be as reliant on some of those space assets if the rest of their um, resources around the world were, were, were threatened. So just something to think about. Okay, questions? Let's try this side over here. Go ahead. Okay, good afternoon. I was just a follow up question, Professor Goswami. Uh, can space, can the deterring effect of space be separated from missile defense? Because you were thinking about, you were talking about conventional capabilities. And so I'm thinking, can we separate the deterring value of space uh, to all the panel, I, I would say, um, from missile defense and from US missile defense? And I would say that perhaps the US does not see missile defense or has been developing missile defense as other actors that we referenced this afternoon have used uh, missile, def missile, the missile as a weapon. I'm not a military, so, but using missile capabilities. Thank you. That's again, uh, I, think, I think if I want to answer that question, I would have to think about how the Chinese are using uh, their own space uh, support for nuclear missile communications navigation but so it's connected in terms of not just conventional missile capability but also nuclear missile so uh, space is actually connected to that in their conceptualization including towards the notion of deterrence right now one of the biggest scenario where i have seen the chinese academy of military sciences worry about is that in case uh, they take out U.S. Uh, capability uh, to uh, track nuclear launch. And there is the inability, we are blind, right? So the U.S. might calculate that this means that the China is going to invest in either a conventional attack or escalation to nuclear level, right? That, that's a scenario. It's not the reality. So there is that concern very clearly. So you can see that it is connected. Uh, their space support, space capability to the concept of missile defense. And also within their own theater, uh, more and more of their precision navigation, uh, especially precision strike, uh, including underwater. Uh, so China is now developing two, two very interesting platforms. One is just last year, they announced a platform in space. It's an orbital platform that's uh, going to use artificial intelligence and CubeSats to not just do space debris, but also uh, space deterrence, deter the adversary. Uh, and the second concept is missile support in the Taiwan Strait, including underwater vehicle. So you can see it clearly connected to the deterrence strategy. Well, I'd say in general, you know, we, we had the question earlier, um, or I guess you made this statement about integrated deterrence and, and what it is and what it isn't. And I, I would say the way we think about deterrence is really that none of these things are separable. And arguably there's, for the same reason, there's no such thing as a space war, right? There's only war and it may extend to or start in space, but, but there's not a space war independent of other things going on. Um, and I think the same rationale holds for can space deterrence be separated from anything? Like, likely not, but it can contribute. And this is, I, I think Eric made a great point earlier that um, space can contribute to deterrence on Earth. You know, the, it, our systems cannot be a vulnerable target. This is why we're accelerating our transition to 
a, a resilient by design architecture. We're trying to make all of our space systems, you know, we're, we're working towards proliferation, disaggregation. Uh, some of these concepts were talked about earlier, but the idea is that if our systems are um, harder to attack, harder to take out, less single points of failure, then we've now taken away the incentive for the adversary to attack those to begin with. So let's go back to the PRC. We know that the PRC intends to challenge us in space to accomplish their military objectives and that they intend to use space to their own advantage for their forces. Well, so then the inverse of that is, is how we get to deterrence. We need to make sure that our systems are resilient, that they are not inviting targets, that contributes to stability, right? And that we can protect and, and defend the joint force from uh, hostile uses of space. So we're challenging China on, on both of their theories of how space would contribute to a conflict, but, I, but it's, not a, it's not something distinct from integrated deterrence. It's all of a piece. The only, the only thing I would add is one of the, one of the principal um, mission purposes for a lot of our space systems is tied into either missile defense or employment of missiles for over the horizon fires. And uh, to the degree that, um, that we're able to continue creating um, clear, clear understandings of the, uh, the strategic kind of bright lines of, hey, you're launching missile at the homeland versus you know, missile tracking and defense for, um, for intercept purposes. I think that there's, there's a good discussion to be had about you know, where, the, uh, where we may not want to aggregate capability. Um, but the, only, the other thing I would say is um, one of the things our allies are looking for the most from is that, is that collective defense, which a lot of it ends up coming in the form of missile defense. Great, uh, thank you for a fascinating panel. Uh, the question I wanna pose is that, um, so it's about this group is, in the other hats that we, that many of us wear, it's really the commercialization of space and the role of the private sector, which is becoming quite transformative in this space. So our abil the ability for the private sector to launch and put satellites up has been mind numbing given how much for us and the government entities, how long it took and how expensive it was. But then the next level is, so the judge, you know, the general raised the issue of nuclear as analogy. And the way we've organized our logics is to have the silos tied to the platforms. So you have a space command, you have the nuclear command. When in reality, what's odd about space is it's bringing together the issues of those classic deterrence platforms. So that space, if you cannot hide because of the impact of the penetration from space, many of our other deterrent platforms then become at risk. And the Chinese clearly have understood that those other platforms can be um, weakened by a much more intensive technological arming of space, but not just of arming, of technological penetration so you can't hide and can't hide across all platforms. That would be totally transformative because of the ability of the adversary to say, we're really not afraid because we know where all of your potential platforms are. And therefore we, are, we know exactly their capability and space. And if you do anything, we will be able to respond accordingly and ironically their deterrence will be greater than our deterrence. And who in the Pentagon is thinking about that given the way we've siloed all of the understandings of how we do the commands? Yeah, so Dan, I think that is sort of, and Dan, we want to get the right spelling of your name because if I have to learn Mandarin, we want to know who was the individual who was not able to see the integration of the different platforms and how space is starting to become quite literally the high ground and the follow on consequence if we don't understand what, what it means for them to have them have that level of penetration as we might have also.
<laughs> so I, I would say it's not lost on us that space is, uh, you know, I said in my opening remarks, it's a key pillar of integrated deterrence. Um, we see space as connecting not just our conventional capabilities, but all of our strategic capabilities. And so that's why not only is it, it's important to having combat credible forces full stop, not just in space, but space underpins all of our other combat credible forces, our maneuver forces, our Navy fleet, they're all built on the assumption that space is available. Um, nuclear, obviously, it's whether it's it's warning, it's the C2 of nuclear, all, all of that depends on space. And so, you know, we know that our, our competitors have taken note and they, they want to gain the information advantage. And so I, I just go back to what I said earlier, that the way that we can contribute to deterrence through space is by ensuring that those capabilities are there in some form or fashion. That's why resilience is such a key part of assuring our overall space missions because it contributes in all of those ways to, um, to strategic and conventional deterrence. So I'm not totally sure I answered your question, but that, that's my, my first stab at it. I think one of the things that I think, I think you're, you're hitting on is historically, conventionally, at least in the way that our services are structured, they were very platform centric. Whereas in the, in the case of the PLA, they're effectively mission centric. It's someone at, at, at the 06 level, the senior 06 level. So, you know, one of Dan's counterparts in the PLA would have a whole series of tools from EW to cyber to direct ascent to co-orbitals um, all at their disposal to achieve an end, which is denial of space. Um, I think, though, that that's partly the reason as we look at the way that the COCOMs have structured, and especially with the stand-up of U.S. Spacecom, part of the intent was to create that greater degree of integration in terms of the uh, space as a domain mission set. I mean, it was, it was established not as a functional COCOM, but as a regional COCOM for good reason, so that you know, we would have the, the opportunity to, to exercise that same kind of integrated approach. So I think we're turning a bit of the corner, but let's be honest. I mean, this is a great case where the, the second mouse got the cheese. The Chinese watched what we did in development of our space capabilities over decades. They not only emulated it, but they identified where our gaps were uh, and had developed, you know, in the direction that we probably would have liked to have done if we had to do it all over again. And so there is a, there is a, a, a challenge that we've got to face down. So one point about the PLA that is very different is that uh, the PLA is not a national army uh, like ours. It's the army of the party. And because of that, there are political officers at all levels in the PLA that are overseeing decisions that are made by military officers from the battalion level all the way on up. They've not fought a war yet with that structure. So we're not quite sure how their decision cycle is gonna be affected by that. We can pretty much believe that our decision cycle will likely be a lot quicker because it may not be as uh, connected into that political infrastructure at that level. The big question is, at the end of the day, is that political connection going to give them a better chance of strategic success at the expense of tactical success, right? So we view tactical success as the most important thing. And we believe in our heart of hearts that it's always gonna to lead to a strategic victory in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. So just something to keep in mind. And I, as a question that came up and you brought it up a minute ago and it got me thinking, and I'm wondering if, the, if, the, if you all could respond to this, what would it be in our best interest to have the Chinese have a high level of confidence in their ability to track our nukes. In other words, if we turn this whole thing on its head, and, and what I'm thinking about is the incident that occurred in Russia in the early 1980s, when there's a Russian Lieutenant Colonel right now who may even be dead by now, but uh, he is singularly responsible for the fact that this planet still exists. They were, he was on duty that night and there was an incoming, what appeared to be an incoming raid of US nuclear tipped missiles. 
and the all the procedures said he was supposed to fire and launch all the Russian missiles before they impacted these nukes impacted the Russian soil. And, and this guy, apparently the way the story goes, is he just said that doesn't make sense. Why would the US do that? It doesn't make sense that they would have done that. And he decided a lieutenant colonel on his own not to fire the counter battery. And it turns out it was in fact, obviously a glitch in the system. So if we keep that in mind, are we potentially in a position where if the Chinese had a very high degree of confidence in their ability to track our nukes, some of that may even have to come from us. Would that lessen the chance of there being an accident in that, in that particular domain? I'm not advocating either way. I'm simply, I thought I'd put you all on the spot before we let you go today because of that nice lunch we fed you. So if uh, you want to start at the end. Yeah. Of the so, um, from what, what I've observed is that the Chinese uh, typically go to the deepest, darkest places in terms of what they assume our plans, objectives, and strategies are. And so I guess I would, I would critique a little bit the question because even if they had a high degree of confidence that they knew where all of our, you know, typically, I think, they're, they would assume they would assume a cat and mouse game that was still uh, under the surface, even even with that in mind. Um, and so I think that they would you would see continued escalation as as Namrata was just suggesting, um, as well as I mean I I can say at least that as they develop some of their space capabilities, they've done so with a mind towards hey we assume that the U.S. is already doing something that looks like this, so therefore we're gonna. <laughs> Go down a, a you know, dark road. No right. A uh, great question. So, uh, will there be someone like the Lieutenant Colonel in China that would basically uh, PLA Strategic Support Force, for example? Um, so, uh, if you so your scenario is that. They think that it's coming at them, right? Yeah. In a glitch in a system. So they had confidence that they would be able to detect the track. Yeah. So, I mean, whether so there will be there are two two answers to your question. One is that uh, in the operational side, what would be they would basically think about how can we stop nuclear uh, attack on us, right? So that's impossible if it's if mm -hmm. if that is the case. The second thing is uh, it'll. I think the first tendency would be to think of it as a glitch in the system, mm -hmm. as far as I, I, I can see. Because uh, even if it's the, Thai, for example, let's take a realistic scenario like Taiwan, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have escalation of conflict in Taiwan, the, the Chinese strategy would be to initiate the conflict and to do a very quick uh, attack and exit strategy, mm -hmm. very quick, which I see it with India, I see it in North Korea and elsewhere. So in, in case of if, 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 so the first grand strategic calculation they would have is that, is Taiwan so critical to the United States that they would launch a nuclear attack on our mainland? When they know that we have nuclear weapons as well mm -hmm. that can reach, right? So that would be the strategic mm -hmm. calculation. Now, but then miscalculations can happen and we mm -hmm. hope it doesn't. Right, so and so yeah. space systems are critical. And then to answer your question, I, I, I thought it was a really important question in terms of how do the Chinese think about integration, about space and commercial. So uh, one of the study that actually happened in 1986, and this was before China had seen what happened in 1991 with the Gulf War. And s most people argue that's the first space war, right? Supported by space systems. So in 1986, Deng Xiaoping commissioned a very important study called Comprehensive National Power. And in that study, he commissioned the Academy of Military Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Sciences to tell him what is it that China needs to focus on in the next 20 years? And where will China be in 2020? So the Academy of Military Sciences pointed out that the most important technology that needs to be focused on is science and technology and within that space and automation. And the Chinese Academy of Sciences had very similar suggestions, but also argued for information, uh, uh, basic building legitimacy for the Communist Party and education. <laughs> 
education was key. So fast forward to 2020 uh, with President Xi Jinping, who is also coming from that generation. Uh, so, and, and so it's important to realize that some of the very important decisions they have taken around space is to include space uh, in their, uh, so the Politburo has a new unit called the Civil Military Fusion Unit, and space is now a very critical component of that. If you listen to President Xi Jinping's speeches to the Strategic Support Force, again, space is seen as a very important uh, grand strategic enabler. So it's seen as an enabler to their other activities, but it's long-term thinking. This didn't start uh, with uh, what they can do in space. It started in the 1980s, so thank you. I think it's very critical for the United States, what, when I listen to the conversation, to build alternate uh, support structures as well, besides being so dependent on space. Okay. I think that's the first lesson I get from this conversation. Well, I'd say in light of everything that we've heard today, I mean, I, I think it's undeniable that the PRC seeks to, to contest us in space and that we are, we are going to protect and defend our stuff and our interest and the joint force. And in fact, um, that it would be irresponsible not to, but that we needn't be scared of that because that one, that's what a Department of Defense does, but the, the more resilient we are, the more we take away an incentive and invite attack, and the more that that contributes to stability. And then I know I'm probably el elapsing my 30 seconds, but I'd say this is where the norms efforts are also really important. We have to have ways where we have a common language to to talk about what constitutes behaviors that are outside the norm so that um, we can lower the chance of risk or the risk of miscalculations and, and misperceptions. Thanks. I think we've drawn a bunch of assumptions over the course of the day to day in terms of what we believe other actors would or wouldn't do, most of which unfortunately have been painted through the lens of our own experiences uh, and in our own exposure. You know, when we talk about the Chinese in particular, but same could apply to the Russians, um, you know, our, our philosophies around what is strategic versus tactical um, aren't really the same um, as when we're talking about the Chinese. Um, the idea of commercial versus civil versus scientific versus military is, is a farce when we're talking about some of our adversary nations. Um, and therefore, the things that drive us uh, are not necessarily gonna be the same things that are gonna drive them. I think that takes us back to kind of a real politique mentality of saying, you know, we need to, to be able to demonstrate that we've got uh, a balance of power uh, advantage through the development of our capabilities in order to uh, sow simple doubt in our adversary's belief that they can actually succeed should they decide to take uh, take conflict um, into space ultimately uh, as a as a part of a broader uh, a broader operation or broader set of set of objectives um, that may exist in the South China Sea or elsewhere. Say a few words and then. Yeah. Well, we'll wrap things up. Thank you all so much. That was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Is that okay? That's fine. Well, thank you, everybody, for spending the day with us. My name is Daniel Rothenberg. I am a professor at Arizona State University. I co-direct something called the Center on the Future of War. We're co core partners with the Interplanetary Institute on the Preventing Space War Project. Um, Bob Schmidl is a faculty member with our center. We're a partnership between ASU and a think tank in DC called New America. Um, first of all, you know, I want to thank our speakers. You know, we had three exceptional panels, and in each panel, there was an effort to bring together military, academia, and industry. Um, so thanks to Joseph Cox, Christopher Johnson, Charles Galbraith, Josh Wolf, Dan Sepperly, Matthew King, Namrata Goswani, William Dan Sanders, and Eric Brown. 
And again, thanks to all of you. Um, I just thought I'd say a, a couple of words. I mean, we're thrilled, uh, you know, on behalf of Arizona State University, you know, we're a, a large public research university. I could say it in Arizona, but look where we are today. We're in Washington, DC. This is an ASU building. We have a, another building uh, in Los Angeles and you know, who knows where the next ones will spring up. <laughs> um, one interesting thing about, about space, maybe that that's, not been on the, on the minds of, of all the panelists is your space is a very odd domain. We, we were using this word, but we all know pretty viscerally some of the other domains, you know, land we know well, ocean, seas we know well, um, air, you know, it's not that long ago that people were able to sort of know the air space. You know, that's how many of us got here. Space, space is a little bit different, right? I mean, there are very few people, maybe some, some in this room, but very few people who actually know space viscerally. Um, and yet it's a domain that affects us intimately in a fashion that we, we've come to take for granted, even though the history of that is enormously recent. You know, our cell phones, or just the world around us, even the mention of GPS, GPS's role in the military, but you know, what, when don't we use GPS in our daily lives? I bring that up only because, you know, this is the Preventing Space War Forum is our idea, but it's not exactly clear what space war is as something distinct and special. We have, we have a, you know, a vision in our mind of what space war might be coming from movies and the like, but it's arguable that you know, the, the post 9-11 wars were space wars and that they relied heavily on you know, precision munitions. The entire US vision of managing at least some aspects of the conflict involved space as a core element of how those wars were prosecuted um, regardless of you know, their, their turnout. I'm just saying that, that you know, it's, Preventing space war is, is both something obviously aspirational and that we kind of wanna prevent war at almost every instance. Um, I just suggest to you and just some, some final thoughts that you know, all of this discussion is about uncertainty. Uh, we live in a world that's sort of amazing. I mean, the, the intimacy we have with space is something, you, in human history, there's just never been a time like this. We take, for, we take this for granted because we take a lot of things for granted that are part of our strange transformative world. But this creates all kinds of uncertainties of a type that, are, that involve great dangers. And maybe I just submit to you that, that all of the, you know, we talked about sort of three or three thematic panels, you know, law, particularly law of armed conflict, right, shall, you know, deterrence as an idea, and then awareness. But that all of these terms are, um, we can think of them as tools for managing uncertainty. Um, and the issue of space war is ultimately an issue of a certain kind of uncertainty that we face. We can't resolve the uncertainty. It's, it's, it's baked into the world we're in. Maybe we can't ever resolve uncertainty, but I suppose the, the, um, the challenge we have is to outline the situation and speak about and think about these tools in a way that minimizes the dangers that this very real uncertainty brings to us. And so, you know, we're at ASU thrilled to be part of that process and thrilled to include all of you in wherever these conversations take us. And again, thank you for all your time. Thank you so much, Daniel. All right. So um, I think this closes out our day together. I want to start by thanking all of you for participating in this very engaging dialogue. We are uh, at ASU and Interplanetary in particular, very much looking forward to staying connected uh, with this new uh, group that we've brought together today. Um, and um, I just would like to say a few thank yous before, before we part. So thank you to Daniel Rothenberg and uh, Bob Schmidl, who's here um, uh, from ASU for, and of course, where is she? And Melissa DeSwartz. Thank you so much, the three of you. A big round of applause. Thank you so much for, for leading, co-chairing, moderating, and making today uh, really an exceptional uh, and, and informative and important uh, day. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to also say a quick thank you and recognize our ASU students. So we have Chantal Sati, John Shiver, Mariah Mari, and Matthew Pedoni, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name. Good enough. Thank you so much for being here and for helping with all the logistics and taking notes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to Roxanne Ladd and Paolo Rivera. I don't know if they're here, but uh, for their gracious support and hosting us here in this beautiful facility. There he is, Paolo. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.
Okay, and I saved the best for last. So I would like to uh, extend a gigantic thank you to Taryn Struck, our Senior Program Manager at the Interplanetary Initiative. She has really masterfully orchestrated and executed every single detail behind this uh, forum. And I um, think it's safe uh, for me to say that this event would not have happened without her. So all my love to you. Thank you so much, Taryn. Excellent. And again, I hope we stay connected and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Oh, well, and there's this. So <laughs> if we want to keep things going, uh, we're doing a no host happy hour at Blackfin. So I hope you're able to stick around. Thank you.